In middle school and in high school, people challenged my belief in Christ. And because I do not want to believe in Jesus just because I've been hoodwinked or brainwashed into believing him, I had to do a lot of thinking and a lot of studying. Why do I believe in Christ? What's the evidence that God exists? What's the evidence you can trust a 2,000-year-old book called the Bible to give you any type of truth? And the more I studied, the more I found that indeed Jesus Christ is the truth. No, I can't prove Christ, but I can't prove anything in life. To prove means to show that it cannot be another way. I can't prove to you that I'm not just a bad dream you guys are having right now. But the overwhelming evidence is, no, I'm sitting here and you're sitting there. So I can't prove that God exists, but the overwhelming evidence of order and design pointing to a designer, of this innate drive for meaning in life, of love. Love demands there be more to reality than simple matter and energy, simply biochemical reactions. There's got to be some type of spiritual being who creates us with this innate ability to love. So when you begin to think and observe your experience of life, indeed, you begin to understand God is real. Jesus Christ is the truth. All right, I'm not, I'm not going to waste your time on this intro because we have a three hour long podcast to get into and I'm very excited. I'm going to be here with Cliff and his son Stuart. Now these two gentlemen go around college campuses and they debate. They debate in a loving way about Christianity and why Christ might be the way that you should head. Uh, I don't want to give any more spoilers. Buckle up. This is going to be a crazy ride. Uh, and the, yeah, I, I'm so bad at these intros. Let's just let's just get right into it. Yeah? Okay. I opened up the, the floor to an audience, right? So my audience knows that I, uh, I love talking about Christ. Um, and before we go into this podcast, I want to describe how I feel this podcast uh, is going to go and who it's for. There's three types of man in my eyes, my eyes. Christianity is an invitation from God. Okay. And a man could look at it and go, yes, I want to be a part of this. I absolutely want to be a part of this. And then there's another man that goes, no, absolutely not. I won't even, not even caring to realize what this is. I've read it. It's, it's hypocrisy. It's stupid. Uh, uh, it, it's sexist. It's racist. It's everything that I don't want to be a part of. I don't want it. Okay. And then the third man. And I believe this is the one that I pray to God that has our viewers, their hearts are open to. And this is what it is. I don't know what I want to do with this right now. So I'm going to put it right here and I'm going to get to it when I can. I want this podcast to be for somebody who hasn't made their decision yet. And I do have a bunch of beautiful questions that people uh, sent to me. But before we get into all that, I want to get into what possessed you guys to follow Christ full heartedly, to just give up your whole livelihoods, to make it specifically for Christ. Um, Stuart, I know you're, you're following in the amazing footsteps of your father. Uh, I want to know a little bit more about you, and then, and then we'll jump into the, to the main man, uh, and then me and you could just debate about stuff. Uh, <laughs> how did you get into it? Were you, were you inspired by your father, or was it strictly another situation that happened in your heart where you're like, okay, I'm going to now join my father? So in high school, I ran from anything related to you know, pastor or anything related to campus debates or anything like that. Mm. And I feel like, I, I've heard you make nice illustrations where it's, it's sort of like the hound of heaven always is chasing you, no matter what, no matter how hard you push against it, yeah. God is going to be chasing you. So it's something like 75% of kids from Christian homes lose their faith in college because of certain groups they get into, a lot of professors are against the faith, but then it's like 50% that comes back. Yeah. And I love that it's the hound of heaven chasing them. I never fully gave up my faith, but Almost to the point of kind of the middle. I would love to ask you what was it that made yeah. you? Because I'll, I'll, I'll be vulnerable first, so that way you're yeah. not the only one. When I came out, uh, a different type of came out, homie. Like <laughs> let's relax, <laughs> let's relax. <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> Poor choice. Uh, when I came into being an adult, uh, I found how slippery it is to become your own god. Mm. And when you find your success, when you find your power, when you find your money, when you find your lane and you find nobody's hovering over you telling you what's good or what's bad, um, I decided that, you know what, I'm an adult. Let me ponder what life would be without God. And I could confidently tell you from a man who's had a relationship with Christ since a very, very young age, separating myself from God was the best way I could put it is putting myself in a dark place. No light. Very, very alone and very, very scary. So I gave up my light to try to find my own light. I'm my own light. What was it that in college, was it a professor? 
Was it uh, a woman maybe that uh, changed your beliefs? What was it? Because I want to pinpoint it because there is a gentleman out there that's walking in your shoes and I want to make sure that they don't slip and not come back from a situation that you came back from. So honestly, I remember the exact place I was in and the exact time. It was my sophomore year of college and I was at a Christian liberal arts college. So you would think, oh, it's, it's obviously he's going to go a route, whether it's Christian business, whatever it is. And I was sitting at my desk and I called him and I said, hey, look, I don't know if I believe in this stuff. And I had a stack of books from all different worldviews and I read them all. And like you said, all of them seemed bankrupt, especially the atheistic position. Yeah. There was so much darkness and meaninglessness. Mm. And so it was that point where I really dug deep emotionally, but especially intellectually in the sense of I got to read this stuff. And if I don't look into the evidence, I don't really want to believe it. And so that's what really changed me. It was some professors for sure, but I would say that conversation where you basically said, yo, look, it's totally up to you. It's, it's totally up to you. D don't be a Christian because I'm a Christian or your mom's a Christian, whatever. You need to decide this. And I was in a little bit of a dark place off and on. And so that definitely, I think, attracted me to God as well. S just seeing all the other worldviews and all the other things like money, like attraction, like mm -hmm. girls, like whatever it might be, where it was ultimately, you were just going down a road that it was gonna be dead ends. Um, I do have a question based on you know your experience. As a father, how did that make you feel that- I was gonna <laughs> ask the same question. I love you so much. <laughs> that your son, you know, kind of, I mean, obviously, you know, you told him, you know, do what you wanna do, whether you are, don't be a Christian because of me, but in that moment, how did that feel? Oh, I, because I'm convinced that Jesus Christ is by far the best option for anybody to put their faith in. I was nervous. Mm -hmm. I was concerned for him. Uh, he grew up and I grew up in a very wealthy part of the world. Uh, it's the Gold Coast of Connecticut. The people in our hometown work on Wall Street and they know how to make a buck, to mm -hmm. put it mildly, not just one or two. And yet when you see the emptiness of materialism, when you see where the love of money leads, it's not pretty. Oh my God. Yeah, not pretty at all. It's, it, it's a hamster wheel. Mm -hmm. I watch these people, loved ones, mm -hmm. loved ones. I watch these people, if I have this, then I'm going to be happy. If mm -hmm. once I get to this, then I'll yep. be happy. And then I could watch them drowning themselves with, with drugs. Mm -hmm. but, and by the way, I, I fell off of a, like a slippery path mm -hmm. and marijuana helped me cope. Mm -hmm. But whose phone is that? Is that yours? Is that my phone? No yours. way. Is yours in your bag? It's it's okay if it's yours. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's okay. Well, if it's yours. Scared, <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay if it's yours. <laughs> but if it was. Come on, honesty is the best policy here. Come on, Cliff. I don't know. Is that that mine? sounds like your ring. Oh, could be wrong. I am so sorry. No, no, no. You, you're totally fine. Oh no, it's not you. No, it's not. Well, let me turn you off just in case. No, it is Who you. Was it? Oh, it was you. It was you. It's now. Woo. My oh, whole team is like this. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Well, no, no, it's because I thought it was sorry. my team and they were just watching it keep going <laughs> off. And I'm like, the first three rings, I'm like, okay, guys, like, just let's figure it out. Cliff, don't let that happen again. Devil <laughs> <laughs> is in here, man. <laughs> <laughs> AC phones. <laughs> That's so funny. No, I, I'm so sorry. I just didn't want to interrupt you guys. Um, Cliff, how did you? How did you find Christ in a way where you're like, I'm going to go and debate this with people? Because I know you're debating it because you want to challenge their hearts. Because I feel like a man could only know who God is when he asks the right questions or like tries to hear it from a point of view that he wants to hear it from, if that makes any sense. Sure, it does. In middle school and in high school, and then in really intensely in college, people challenged my belief in Christ. And because I do not want to believe in Jesus just because I've been hoodwinked or brainwashed into believing him, but I want to believe in him because he's reliable, I had to do a lot of skeptical questioning, mm -hmm. a lot of thinking, and a lot of studying. And I am not a natural student. I am not an intellectual. I would prefer to play tennis or basketball or just hang out. <laughs> but because I was asked so many hard questions, that challenged me to think through, why do I believe in Christ? What's the evidence that God exists? What's the evidence that Jesus is reliable? What's the evidence that there's life after death? What's the evidence you can trust a 2000 year old book called the Bible to give you any type of truth? And so that forced me against my will <laughs> to study and to find evidence to support this faith. 
And that was a very healthy exercise. Mm -hmm. And the more I studied, the more I found that indeed Jesus Christ is the truth. No, I can't prove Christ, but I can't prove anything in life. To prove means to show that it cannot be another way. I can't prove to you that I'm not just a bad dream you guys are having right now. Maybe I'm a bad dream you're having right now. But the overwhelming evidence is, no, I'm sitting here and you're sitting there. And that's why we behave and treat each other the way we do, because the evidence is we're really here having this conversation. So I can't prove that God exists, but the overwhelming evidence of order and design pointing to a designer, of this innate drive for meaning in life, of love. Love demands there be more to reality than simple matter and energy, simply biochemical reactions. There's got to be some type of spiritual being who creates us with this innate ability to love. So when you begin to think and observe reality, when you observe your experience of life, indeed, you begin to understand God is real. Jesus Christ is the truth. When you study the, the evidence for the historical resurrection, Christ really died. He just didn't lapse into unconsciousness. A Roman soldier took a spear jammed into his side, and we read in the Gospel of John that an issue of watery serum separate from red hard clotted blood flowed from his side. They didn't understand that medically in the first century. We know very well. George, please don't stick yourself on the side and have clotted blood flow separated from a watery serum flowing out because it means heart failure, you're dead. So he really died. And they buried him in a very well-known tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And over a period of 40 days, he appeared to over 500 people. Well, when you begin to realize that when you're sitting at grandma and grandpa's funeral, at mom and dad's funeral, that either this is the end, because there is no God, and if there is no God, obviously there's no life after death, or this is the possible beginning of eternal life in heaven, all of a sudden, you got a passion inside to say, what's more important than that? There isn't anything else more important, if you love people. And so that's what fueled me, George, to go out and start standing up on college campuses and challenging people to consider Christ. Wow. That's incredible. And I think what I love is that, you know, you said you're like, I'm not an intellectual, you know, you don't like to study, no. right? And I, I just think that that's so, it's so true, you know, because usually when you, <laughs> yeah, you so meet true, somebody, man. not for, yeah, not for not you, intellectual right? <laughs> <laughs> no, not for you, but you, you read know. my mail, you're right. <laughs> I know it, no, 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 but no, you know, normally when you, you meet somebody, I mean, to me, you seem, you are incredibly intellectual and you're so wise. And so you would think that you were born with this ability to, you know, to have such intelligence. And so I think that that is so inspiring to everybody. You know, if you feel like, well, I'm not somebody who's good at school. I'm not good, somebody who's good at studying. So maybe they don't want to they don't want to reach for their Bible. They don't want to reach for the research, you know, to really learn. Mm -hmm. So I just think that that's incredibly inspiring. And, you know, I think that's amazing. I, I have a question for you. Um, how does a man who does not know Christ at all, wasn't born in a religion that serves Christ, um, and if he is, by the way, I'm talking as if I'm not a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he is the way, the truth, the life, how is it that a man who's so far away from God, isn't it kind of unfair that he starts out at a different spot than a man who was born in a Christian home that knows God? It, it, does God love him less than the man that was born in a Christian home? And how does he answer his calls? I answer, I asked that because I was blessed to be in, in a Christian home where my parents molded me as a child and I find that to be the most important part of a childhood. And that's why I am very heartbroken to see what's going on in schools now because we're forgetting that kids are empty vessels. When they're young, you could fill them into whatever. If I have a child here and I say, hey, shoes are God, this boy is going to believe that the shoes are God. So how is it fair that a man who is far away from Jesus when he's born, how, what, what's his relationship with God and how can he find God the same way that a Christian man found God in a home where his mother goes, Christ is the way, the truth, the life? That's a very sensitive, thoughtful question, George. And you're right, it's not fair. You're absolutely right. A lot of our childhoods are not fair. All of our parents hurt us in some way and Although I love the living daylights out of this guy, I, because of my sinfulness, hurt him. And I hurt his two brothers as well. When I sinned, when I lost my temper, when I was selfish, I hurt my kids. And my parents hurt me. So you're right. Life is not fair. Okay, so what do you do with a person who says, well, Cliff, I'm just at the beginning. What do I do? I say, you know, I wish you and I could take a trip to the Grand Canyon. And as we're standing there at the edge of the Grand Canyon, if I say to you, wow, aren't I awesome? <sighs> That's embarrassing. Cliff, you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon. 
It is so awe-inspiring. And what are you caught up with? Myself. Okay, now we're not going to be able to do that, are we, George? You and I are not going to be able to go to the Grand Canyon today or tomorrow. All we got to do is go out tonight when it's real dark. Look about the moon and the stars. Begin to contemplate the vastness of the galaxy, the vastness of the universe. Am I going to stand there and say, wow, George, aren't I awesome? That is to part company with reality. Yes, we are awesome because God created us, and that's good. But there is something, someone far bigger than Cliff, far bigger than all of us put together. And when you begin to contemplate that and allow the awesomeness of God, the awesomeness of the majesty of his creation to sink in, you're beginning to open up your heart to God. And then the second thing I would encourage people to do is read the Gospels. Don't start in Genesis in the Bible in the beginning. Go three quarters of the way through to the New Testament, the first four books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because that's the eyewitness account of Jesus of Nazareth, how he lived, how he treated people, what he taught ethically, how he died, praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Man, I'd have been saying, God, nail those suckers for nailing me to a cross. Not Christ. He prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But fourthly and most importantly, in those Gospels, read about how three days after he died, he physically, bodily rose from the dead. Now, this Jesus who rose from the dead said, I love you, God loves you. Guess what, George? If you die and rise from the dead, I will listen very carefully to everything you have to say. Because the evidence is you're in touch with reality. All right, that's exactly what Jesus pulled off. He died, he rose from the dead. And so when he says that God loves you, and that God has a future for you that includes eternity when you put your faith in him and accept that invitation that you talked about so beautifully at the beginning of this show. Wow, you, let's open up and let's receive him into our lives as our savior and Lord. I love that so much. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt, but I know you guys have been seeing the Heart of David line that I dropped. Church boy, this is the last week to grab it. So if you wanted to be a part of the first drop ever, make sure you hit that link in my description and grab your apparel today. And for those of you guys that did order from all of my heart, thank you so much. I love you guys. Uh, now back to your program. When I debate with, um, with fellow friends that are atheist or uh, in any other type of religion, <clears throat> I actually pretend uh, that my God is equally proven as much as their God. Because I think that my God is so mighty that he's going to open our eyes. Like if you truly call out to a God, he's going to open your eyes. And I remember when um, Jonah was uh, right before he gets swallowed by the whale. Uh, he, the sailors are freaking out because of the weather of the storm. Mm -hmm. And they're running around. They're like, who cursed God? And I found it so beautiful that everybody gathered and they prayed to their God. And so I take that example when I'm with a, a, a Muslim that I respect or with a, a Jewish man that I respect because I respect every man that I see. Because if I do believe in the God that I believe, there's no way that my God walked on this earth showing everybody respect and then I can't show somebody respect. It's, mm -hmm. it's stupid for me to think this way. So after we debate or we have a, a conversation and also with fellow Christians, I say, pray to your God and have him open my eyes if it be true. Mm -hmm. And I pray to my God mm -hmm. that he opens your eyes. And I, and I just pray that people could be on this level of um, respect mm -hmm. because then there's no room for war mm -hmm. because then we're putting it on our God. And in that boat, they very much knew whose God it was. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. feel like that is where we need to play ball at, not... I'm going to kill you if you don't see it from my point of view. <laughs> but if your God truly exists, wouldn't you want it to leave it in his hands? Very hey, God, I, I love this man, Sam. I, I just, you know, he, he believes more in um, the Big Bang than he believes in you. I pray that you open up his eyes and heart. And I feel like praying for people and praying with people is not talked about enough. I believe that prayer is one of them is the most strongest thing on this earth. I think mm -hmm. it really is. I, I could show from an example of where my heart has been before and after prayer. I feel like in any religion, if any God that you serve, if he exists, why not talk to him about your friend not believing in him? Um, another question I wanted to ask you is, what is it that truly brings a man into heaven? 
I grew up believing that you have to be uh, baptized to go into heaven. Um, and I want to get into baptism a little bit because it's something that kind of like freaks me out. Uh, because I was baptized when I was a, when I was a baby. And when I read the scripture from my POV of what baptism is, I, it's like an engagement, like a proposal. Um, and if I was young enough and I didn't propose myself, does it count? Um, and then now when I'm reading the scripture, I truly feel like there was a Bible verse that scared me. And I want to get your guys' opinion on this. There was a Bible verse that scared me more than anything. Like I ask her, I would walk around this neighborhood crying because I was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die forever because of this Bible verse. And it was the Bible verse uh, that goes, many will come to God and say, have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not casted out demons in your name? Have I not done this and this and this? And God looks at these people that did his work and says, be away from me. I never knew you forever. And in my mind, I go, well, these people dedicated their life to him. And they're like, see ya. Who am I, a man who just goes on YouTube and talks about God, sins every day. I, I'm sitting next to my girlfriend and we're not married. We fool around, Cliff. I'm not proud of it. But we do. We sin. So if these guys are doing this and they're being pushed away, then who am I to be even welcomed into the kingdom of God? And a man explained it to me this way. He goes, because they came with a list of what they did. And the truth is, whatever I do here is not even worth it. And if we're going to measure my worth of going into heaven off of what I've done, it's not going to cut it. If you come to God knowing that the only way that I'm coming into the, to the pearly white gates of heaven is that I fully with my whole heart realize that when God looks at the cross, he sees my sins. And when he sees, oh, sorry, I messed this up. I truly believe that when I go to heaven and they ask me what makes it worthy for you to come in, it's the answer is I'm not. And that he died for my sins. And that also opened up this beautiful avenue in my heart to realize that sometimes as a human, I don't know if I'm doing things because I'm just trying to get into heaven or because I truly love God. But when he just said, if you believe that I died for your sins and that is the reason why you are able to come into heaven, then all of the good deeds that I do, all of that, I'm not doing it to get into heaven. That's not what gets me to heaven. It's, I love Christ so much that he died for me. So I'm not going to waste this day being a piece of crap. I'm going to try my best to be the best that I could possibly be for a man who dedicated his life and sacrificed it for me. My works are nothing. I could spend every day being a monk and it still wouldn't be worth me going into heaven. That gave me so much freedom to realize that my sins and the good deeds that I do are not the measurement of what brings me into heaven. It's solely off the fact that I believe in a God that outweighs my sins. Is this wrong for me to believe? Or is it that you have to get baptized? You have to do all of these things. What is it in your point of view that brings a man into heaven? Yeah, I, well, it's amazing that you hit the cross and you got it so right. Because that even for us, you after 69 years, am I allowed to say that? And 35 years, we still have a tough time communicating it on a university campus or debating with a professor online. Like it's hard to communicate for that person to really understand it. At one level, it, you can communicate it to a six-year-old in, in some sense. Like Jesus died on the cross, took your sins, and so now you can live in total freedom and love for him, for humanity, and a response and type of, of forgiveness as well. So, so I thought you explaining it, it, it's so rare to hear that, so rare, especially in this culture, because the cross is looked at as a bloody, dirty thing that nobody really wants to, to touch. So, so that's a big piece of it. I, I like where you went scripturally as well in terms of Jesus is going to look at people and say, you're just going to have to get away from me because you did it with a certain motivation that wasn't out of humility and understanding that grace is really it, that what he did for us should be the motive, everything for him, like you were saying. And so what, I, what you brought up earlier in terms of some of those friends and probably speaking to this guy who you were speaking to, when you said... 
I think what you said was they try and show that they have a certain level of money that they don't have, and they put on a, a serious type of act, and it leads to things like depression and anxiety. I see that connected to exactly what you're talking about, because these people are doing good works. You look no further than the Pharisees, right? Pharisees, were they were giving away more money, I think, than your average Christian, right? And I think they were also doing more social justice work. And yet, what does Jesus say? He says, inside of the cup, their hearts are just completely filthy and rotten. And, but the outside, it, it was beautiful. It, it was completely gold. So that's kind of a piece of it. I, I, whenever we do, we do confirmation for kids. And so it's simply a matter of, it's not infant baptism, but it's a matter of an outward expression of an inward decision where Christians can say, I'm gonna come alongside of you, hold you accountable ethically, and then encourage you. Mm. And so that's what we see baptism as because the, the, the ultimate word we're looking for here is works righteousness, where it's I got to work my way to God. Yeah. Instead, it's God worked his way to us. And Kira Knightley, when she says that it'd be so easy, she's an outspoken atheist. And when she says it'd be so easy to be a Christian, because I would just do whatever I want and then ask for forgiveness. Yeah. That's not obviously it. What you were saying, uh, you put it, again, you put it well, George, it, it's the faith and the works piece. You have faith, but then you back it up with the good deeds. And would you say that it's kind of the difference of sinning and, you know, feeling guilty about it and realizing what you've done wrong and being like, like having true regret about your sin versus doing the sin and being like, eh, well, I mean, you know, it's not that bad. I'm sorry. Right. I think he weighs the heart. Right. Like what you truly reflect on. And, and I think too, in what you brought up, cause we were talking about this recently and it's actually something that I recently learned that question, you know, when God asks you like, why do you think you made it to heaven? And it's not about you, right? It's about what he did for us. And it's something that kind of almost took off this weight of when you do a good deed, it's, it's, it's not coming from a selfish place. And it's truly coming from a place of just like, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. And and, and I'm grateful to be here and I love you and I want to show you my love, my appreciation. And so therefore, I'm going to do my best to show that to the people around me and, and to be the best that I can be for you. I got to ask you something else that's like, um, I'm just going to dig if you guys don't mind. Uh, how is it fair that a God who knows all, who sees all, sees a man who does not believe in Christ? because he wasn't raised to believe in Christ. He's in a country where he can't even know God. I know that there's a, like, is it North Korea? North Korea changes their Bible. It's illegal to have your own Bible. Um, there's positions and places in the world where they cannot reach Christ. But they're the ones that are doing good work when no one's looking. They're the ones that are helping their neighbors. They're the ones who are doing acts greater than Christians that I see at church singing and praising God but he passes away never knowing Christ and he never goes to heaven. How is that fair if there's an abundance and an almighty merciful God? If I'm George Janko and I find that to be unmerciful, how is it fair and how can I convince a man to follow God if this is the direction that the Bible is explaining it to me? Romans 2 talks about but I, I love the whole, like, you look at him, you're like, you want to get this one? I'll warm up. I'll warm up when you, when you can't get it. I'll tap me in. And, and we go back and forth sometimes, especially if it, gets, if it gets real. Well, there's a few questions that get asked at church in front of the entire congregation when we do this Q&A, like we just did this last Sunday. Some of the questions you would not believe. Like, like one woman just front row said, what about masturbation? Like front row, it was a packed Sunday. <laughs> That's a great question, though. It's and a great when, question. You can imagine the squirming and ping ponging back and forth. It was unreal. <laughs> and some people started coming to our church because we allowed that question to get asked. Mm. I think a couple people probably left too. <laughs> but people heard around town. We're about circling that. back to that. Right. By the way, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to drop that, that in my now. arsenal. <laughs> and we're going to get to that. It, just, just a quick fire. Something that really helps me with that good question because that's one of my toughest. That's on like the top three for me for sure. But Romans 2 has helped when we get God talking about it's, it's the knowledge that has been given to you. You'll be judged based off of that knowledge. Mm. So you talked about the starry skies at night, beauty of nature, as well as the inner conscience. So that's evidence right there for any and everybody. Hebrews 11 talks about how the patriarchs are going to be in heaven. So Abraham, Isaac, and others, and they didn't even know who Jesus was. 
And then the last one, it's really helped me a lot. Whoa. Recently. Whoa. That just messed me up a little bit. <laughs> but hold on. Did they get the VIP pass because they were working alongside uh, God? That's... Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. Like, you don't need to know the bouncer if you knew the owner. <laughs> right, right. You know what I mean? like... <laughs> Maybe that one doesn't count. What, what do you think? What do you think about that one? It's the well, Hall of Fame. Yeah. He, Hebrews chapter 11 makes it clear that nobody's going to be in heaven because of their good works. Instead, it's because of their faith. And so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, even the Rahab, the Gentile prostitute, had faith in God. In other words, they responded to all the light, all the information that God gave them in humble faith. So God doesn't measure you off of your knowledge of, do you know the disciples? He, he, he measures you by what he given you and what you decided to believe in in that moment. Exactly. So if a man is in the middle of the wilderness, doesn't know who Jesus is, but he looks up at the stars and he goes, my God, there's something greater than me that's made this. Mm -hmm. Then in God's eyes, he goes, that's a humble man. That's a man that I could work with. Okay, yes, but we don't know, to be honest with you, George, we don't know how God is going to judge those who've never heard about Christ because Christ never answered the question. So I can't make it up and say, this is what Jesus said. He didn't say anything about it. But we do know that God is just, God is fair. He's more fair than I will ever be, than you'll ever be. So we do know that each of us will be judged fairly, uniquely, and justly. Secondly, we do know that we've all sinned. I mean, I was just thinking about this this morning. In my culture, it's not cool if you murder. What would I have done if I'd have been a German pastor at the time of Adolf Hitler? A lot of German pastors supported Hitler. A few German pastors stood up against him. One guy was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He got hung in a death camp. I wonder what I would have done. I wonder if I would have had the courage to stop the Nazis from gassing Jews with everything in my power? Or would I have caved in to the pressure and said, oh, whatever you want to do, you know, I'll keep my mouth shut. The human heart, as Jesus pointed out, is deceitful. I'm a rascal. I'm real glad that you two don't see all of my motives on a screen right behind my head. That would be pretty embarrassing for me. And I appreciate your vulnerability in talking about, okay, my girlfriend and I, we're not exactly obeying Jesus in the area of sexuality. I respect that highly. That's vulnerable. That's honest. But it's wrong. Okay. And good. I don't, I don't, I don't sit here and, and paint it. And I always say that if God looked at me, I, I, I hold, I hold the weight of sin, because when we started, she wasn't fully uh, committed to the Lord as much as I was, and so I was. So it was my decision to go against that. So I pray that that, not punishment, but that guilt, that weight is on me. And I pray that one day we, we are married and I fix that bond. Um, Beautiful. I, I just know that there's a man who sins and says, no, nah, it's not that big of a deal. And I tell people it's a very big deal. I, I made a mistake. Good for you. All right. So Jesus is dying on the cross. Two thieves are hung on either side of him. First thief turns to him and says, come on, miracle boy from Nazareth, get us off these crosses. And then based on that, I'll believe in you. Come on, a little miracle dust, Jesus. And when I see it, I'll believe Second criminal turns to the first criminal and says, you idiot, we're dying here because we deserve it. But this Jesus, he's the innocent, holy, pure son of God. And the second criminal looks at Jesus and says, Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then today he All was. Right. Now, Jesus didn't say, whoa, 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 time out. First, you got to get baptized. Then you got to work in a soup kitchen. And then you got to give all your money or half of it to the poor. And then you got to genuflect. No, he didn't say that. He looks the guy in the face and he says, I tell you the truth. Today you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> Okay, so that's grace, okay? He didn't deserve it, but he trusted in Christ. Christ forgave him and gave him eternal life. Now, if the guy would have gotten off the cross, would he have tried to be baptized? Would he have tried to celebrate communion? Would he have gone to church? Would he have given money to the poor? Absolutely. Would he have lived a perfect life? No way. None of us live a perfect life. Certainly I don't. But by the grace of God, he would have changed and become more the man that God created him to be than he was at that time. So you see, the real issue when it comes to faith is not how many works have you done. The real f issue is, is your faith genuine, sincere, or is it insincere? And sincere faith will be shown in the way I seek to obey Jesus. You've been vulnerable with me, I'll be vulnerable with you. I've had a ter terrible time with my temper. I've lost my temper with my wife, with my children, with students on college campuses, and I've had to ask for forgiveness an awful lot of times. And I'm not this wonderful guy that I wish everyone believe I am. I am a 
sinner, a rebel against God. But God loves this sinner so much, he sent his son Christ to give his life for me, to forgive me and give me eternal life. Now, if I sincerely put my faith in him, with his help, I'm going to change. And if I don't change, then the question of hypocrisy comes up. And though it's what the verses that you quoted so accurately are all about, Matthew 7, 21 to 23, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in, in heaven. Many will come to me on that day, that day of my return, and say, do we not prophesy in your name, perform many miracles, do good deeds? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. See, we didn't have that relationship, that mm -hmm. connection. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So no one's going to be heaven. No one's going to heaven because they were a good old boy, mm -mm. which contradicts cultural American Christianity. Cultural American Christianity says, be a good girl, be a good boy. And God smiles on good boys and good girls. Yeah, but the problem is none of us are good none as God defines good. None That's why we all need Christ. I always get asked when, like, uh, when I'm on the street, they go, how do you... How are you so vulnerable, um, like speaking about things that you're dealing with? Because mm -hmm. uh, Christians are like, I have a hard time even talking to my best friend about it, but you don't care about being on a podcast. And my thought process behind this is, man, I'm so terrified of what Jesus thinks of me and what I'm doing that I could really care less of what an audience member thinks of me. Mm -hmm. They don't have the passing judgment of who and where I'm going. So if I, if I think that the... And I want to say this to see if I'm correct. I think a man is either going to worry about what the world thinks of them mm -hmm. or what God thinks of them. Very good. And it's so much more freeing and mm -hmm. so much rewarding yep. when you put it on a God who's merciful yep. instead of a world that will never, never see it from your point of view. And they're ready to throw the first rock. Um, Man, I'm, I'm so in love with this conversation that like I'm so deep in, into what you guys are saying that I, usually I'm always planning where we're going next, but I'm just like so into what we're going <laughs> in. Um, do you, would you guys like to uh, open up the, the conversations that yes. the audience members have? And then through that, we could naturally go places. Okay. So these are some questions from George's audience members. And um, so the first one we have here is, is Jesus God? Also, I want to add on to that. Uh, is Jesus God? And if he is God, where in the Bible does it state that he's God? Very good. John chapter 8, verse 58. Whoa! Jesus. Yo, you shot from the hip! <laughs> I am so jealous that you could do that. So uh, I just want you to read that verse for yourself. Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. Now the Jews did not call God G-O-D. The Jews called God Adonai. Yahweh. Oh, I thought it was Adonai. Yes, also Adonai mm -hmm. and El Shaddai. Those are different names for God. Got it. And one of them was Yahweh, which is the Hebrew verb to be. I am who I am. There was no misunderstanding. The Jews picked up stones to stone him for blasphemy. Before Abraham was born, I am. Deliberately, Christ is claiming to be God. Then in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. No misunderstanding. They didn't think, oh, I see, this guy's a Hindu. He thinks everybody's part of God, so he's claiming that he, we're all a part of God. No, no, no. Jesus was a monotheistic Jew who understood God is one. The Shema of Israel, hero of Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors yourself. And very deliberately, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Once again, no misunderstanding. The Jews pick up stones to stone him for blasphemy. Then by his deeds, he obviously claimed to be God. Mark chapter 2, Jesus is teaching in a packed out house and all of a sudden the roof is ripped open and a man, a paralyzed man, is lowered on a mat to his feet. Jesus looks into the face of the paralyzed man and says, your sins are forgiven. Bingo. George, you got it. And then they got mad and they were confused. Bingo. And I found that so beautiful because he was trying to weigh that forgiving sins is way more powerful than raising a man who's crippled. Bingo. Precisely. You got it. By claiming to forgive the sins of a man he'd never probably seen before, Jesus is claiming to be God. Because only God can ultimately forgive my sins. If I do you dirty, yes, I have to ask you for forgiveness. But ultimately, I have to ask God for forgiveness. Because when I do dirty to you, I'm saying, hey, God, when you made George, lousy job. I can trample all over him. Baloney. When God made George, he did a wonderful job. And if I denigrate him by tap dancing all over his face... I am guilty, and I need to ask George for forgiveness, but I also ultimately better ask God for forgiveness. 
This video is sponsored by Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth is a premium bedding and loungewear company. I'm actually wearing their loungewear right now and it's super comfortable. This product is made out of fiber from highly sustainable bamboo called Visco. Temperature regulating, so you sleep comfortably year round. Enhanced wavy quality that won't pill. Cozy Earth also offers a 10 year warranty on all of their products. And also they come with thousands of five star reviews. If you're anything like me, you probably run hot when you sleep. And, and, and if you run hot when you sleep, you're not getting any sleep, right? Because you're uncomfortable. Fun in fact, we sleep one third of our life. So if you want to get cozy earth type of sleep, use my discount georgejanko35 or just use the link in the description and uh, enjoy a nice sleep on me. From you to me or me to you. Let's get cozy. Cozy Earth. I don't know about you, but I always judge a company by its packaging, right? But this bag, like, what is this? Like, as soon as I'm done putting my bed in this, I'm taking this. I'm giving this. This is my girl's new purse. Cozy Earth, you got this shit locked down, huh? All right, I'm sorry. Back to the shop. <laughs> Well, we talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. When we, uh, before we ever ask anybody for forgiveness, we, I always say, go to their, go to their owner first. Very good. Mm -hmm. So I ask that because here's, here's the, the reason why I even bring it to God first, because <coughs> first of all, asking somebody for forgiveness is possibly one of the hardest things to do. Mm -hmm. You have to humble yourself into realizing mm -hmm. you were wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I always ask God to forgive me one for quite frankly, forgive me for my language, shitting on his image. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, yep. that is his image. That's his child. Mm -hmm. That's like if I go to somebody's son, I'm like, yo, you, you're cool, dude, but your son's an asshole. Like, that's crazy to think. You can't yeah. disrespect somebody's <laughs> son yeah. and think they're going to be, like, fine with it, right? You yeah. can't. So I ask him for forgiveness, and then I ask him to put, uh, uh, to comfort the man that I'm about to go to his heart. Because maybe he's not ready for my, for, like, hey, man, I'm sorry. Because some people are like, nah, piss off. I don't want to hear your apology. So I always go to the father first because I wronged him first. Very good. And then I ask the man that I, uh, that I did wrong for, for forgiveness. And we just actually recently been practicing that. Yeah. That's actually something that I personally learned um, this last two years was that, you know, I'm just somebody, I used to just very, like to be very hard on myself mm -hmm. and, you know, I have a hard time forgiving myself for things and they really stick with me, you know? And then, you know, through being with George, obviously something that we talked about, he helped me learn and uh, I realized, well, God, if God forgives me, right, who am I not to forgive myself? Beautiful. Right. Perfect. So By the way, correct? I just want to also say, like, you give me so much credit, but none of the credit's mine because I could give you all of the answers, but it's, it's, it's your heart and your decision to either hear me out and follow mm -hmm. where I'm kind of like guiding you. Yeah. And a lot of, I'm going to be honest, I will say this in front of you, a lot of women, they like to be, they like to pick and fight and be like, no, 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 you're wrong. And you are so um, humble and, and so beautiful when it comes to like, hey, you know, when I brought that to you, you don't fight me on it. And so I want to give the credit back to you. That's a, that's a thing between you and God, because I had my parents raise me and teach me, but I could have easily been like, nah, you're wrong. I don't want to hear this. So when you give me uh, the credit, I just want to let you know the credit's back to you. That's between you and God. I'm just the messenger. Your relationship with God is between you and him, and you're, you're doing unbelievable with it, like unbelievable with it. Well, thank you. And absolutely, obviously, it's all praise to God, and it's because of God that he gives us the wisdom in order to learn these things. But I do, I like to, you know, include, I think that it's just, there's, you know, I think it's incredible that I've been blessed with a relationship and with a man who's able to yep. help me learn about God and, and help me with my faith. And so I just, you know, yep. credit that. Stuart, Stuart, are we hearing wedding bells possibly? It is. It's... <laughs> hey, marry us right now. You won't. You won't. The pheromones right now are pretty high. <laughs> We have to because she's pregnant, so we have to get going. Right, there we go. I'm Shotgun. just kidding. I'm Shotgun. just kidding. Yo, his face is like. I, I couldn't hide it. Please. Uh, that's so funny. Uh, Cliff, I have a Middle Eastern mother. That would never happen. <laughs> well, I'd like to meet your Middle Eastern mother sometime. I would love that. I would actually yeah. love that. If you guys are ever in Arizona, you let me know ahead of time, and we'll have a Middle Eastern feast for you guys wow, ready to go. We'll break bread, it. and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the gospel. I actually wanted to... You know what? This one's for my mom. Shout out, mom. This one's for you. All right now, uh, <laughs> we, go, we go head to head. Oh, this is such a good question. I can't wait for you to answer this. Oh, I really hope I'm right, because I'm not going to hear the <laughs> ending of it. Uh, okay, so uh, my church is... I love my church. It's an Assyrian church, and I follow my Assyrian church, because I believe that my church 
truly with all their hearts, they chase after God's heart. And I walked away from my church for a bit, but then I realized that there is no perfect church. And I would love to judge a church on how much they're actually trying to obey Christ. And my church, flying colors, they do. Um, they do sometimes, uh, sometimes, some churches agree, some churches don't, but they, they, they give dates to fast for saints. But they have like this loophole where they, they thank Jesus for the saint or I don't know what the situation is. And I kept telling her, I go, hey, uh, you don't need to do that. Jesus is the only one you need to pray to or talk to. Or, and then we agreed on that. We agreed on that. And then there's one that we ha- were just bumping heads on. She believes that the church was built on the rock Peter. And I'm like, man, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to me. And I could be wrong, but this is my point of view. Doesn't make sense that God's in heaven and he goes, look at Adam, look at Abraham, look at Isaac, look at all these people failing me. And then he comes down, takes human form and he goes, all right, now I'm going to give it to another human. That doesn't make sense to me. There would be no reason for him to come down and then build a church and then say, Peter, whatever you tie on earth, I'll tie in heaven. That doesn't make sense to me. I believe that Jesus is the rock and not Peter. Is there a way that I could explain that? And if I am wrong, we could cut and then we won't roll that, and then you explain it to me. <laughs> we'll cut that out, as a good Christian would do, and, uh, and hide my embarrassment uh, from being wrong. All right, Stuart, you answer the question, but I'm warning you. You don't want to get between a mother and her son. I'm terrified. <laughs> so thrilled. <laughs> he passes that one. <laughs> All right, let me, let me see if I can do a little bit of dancing here. Before, before you answer, who is wrong and who is right? <laughs> I just want to, and by the way, all, all joking yeah. aside, my mom is just like me. We're like, if if it brings us one inch away from God, we would yeah. run, right? So if I'm wrong and put ashes on my head, I'll ask God for forgiveness forever and always. If my mom's wrong, let me know. I'll FaceTime her right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so scripturally, you're both right. Oh, what? Because it says it says that Peter, right after Peter does all the denial. The embarrassing details that come out with Peter, like he's denying he even knows Christ to a seven-year-old girl. But, but just to just yeah. to, not to like brush my ideas towards you, <laughs> but the the Bible verse which she's like Petros and Petros or whatever that is, right, right? right? Okay, I explained to her. I go, why would God get baton the glory yeah, to yeah. him, and then right after he'd mess up, and then he say Satan get behind me. He refers right. to him as Satan. Right, right. So I'm right. Totally. <laughs> I just Come can't, on, I can't do it, man. Come I can't on, do man. it. Okay, okay. We're no, both right. We're both you're right. Totally, we're both you're right. totally right. I mean, so when I say you're both right. Get mom on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I need this lunch in Arizona. No, it, so, so, uh, so we get that with Peter. So it's an incredible statement that Peter does is going to have a lot of power despite his mess up. So it, grace comes into the picture. Thank God, because I've messed up so many times. King David, the man after God's own heart, how many times did he messed up? He murdered, and then he had adultery. Hey, he with murdered the guy in he a murdered. crazy way. He no. did. That was wild. That was wild. <laughs> Honestly, that kind of some... helped me with my porn addiction. Because I'll tell you why. Because like I was like, yes. I'm addicted to porn. I, I fixed it, and I'm working on it. But I didn't kill my best friend to sleep with his wife. That's <laughs> David is wild for that. Right. Can we put the AC on? It's getting hot. I, I thought I was wrong, so I was going to so I'm totally dodging here. I know you're going to hit it harder. But so so you have that passage, but then it's it's Christ hands down because we get Christ died for the church. He's the ultimate bridegroom and the central message of all of scripture, you get 2 thirds of every single gospel is the passion narrative, which is Jesus Christ going to the cross. And ultimately you have in John 17 there his final words and a leader's final words are his most important, right? He talks about being one and building this church community, and it's all on him. So, it, yeah, if it's Peter, I'm trying to think, if it's, if it's Peter, you, you get in a little bit of trouble because, he, again, it gets back to... Doesn't Paul, like, <laughs> kind of embarrass him a few times? Right. He's like, hey, man, you can't teach you the Gentiles. Memory. Can... That's pretty impressive. Very You're good. going deep right now. I, I, read oh. <laughs> <laughs> I read my gospel. I read my gospel. I might act like a pagan, but I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Is this still recording? <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, so, so yeah. should you? So sorry, was when the, so yeah, you're right. Who's wrong? My mom or me? No, no, no. So should you fast for saints? Is that it was a part of your question, right? Like, should you the days that you fast for the saints and you pray oh, to the saints? So that was one of them. We right. we ex- me and my mom agreed that's not the case. And the, and the, I, I, you know. Oh, by the way, if you're having a conversation, I really want this to be clear because this is very important. 
Me and my mom were going back and forth and back and forth, and it became arguments. Kind of ugly. Pushed my father away from wanting to talk about Christ. It, it got to a point where people were like, here comes George. He's going to argue about some stuff. And, and one day I was praying, and I was like, God, come on, man. Like, show her she's wrong and so we can move on from this. And, and show us in this and show us in that. And then one day God was like, I'm going to wait until you ask the right way. And then I said, God, if it's me, let me know. And God goes, you can't, you can't talk to your mom like she's your daughter. It's not going to connect with her. Come with her humbly. Mm -hmm. And so I came to her one day and I said, you know what, mom? I figured out the reason why we're not understanding is not because of you. It's because of me. I was being very disrespectful for how I talked to you. Mind you, I never swore at her. I just, we got passionate and we got argumental with it, but... I have no business or no right to speak to my mom with that type of authority. So I told her, I go, this is my heart. This is how I feel. And the reason I was like this is because I was hurting. And so I opened up the gospel. And so the reason I brought this up is because I think so, the passion could get in, it, it could interfere with the connection. Mm -hmm. um, so humble yourself. If you want to open up somebody else's heart or mind, uh, Sometimes we're trying to prove that we're right so much that we're proving that more than we're proving the will of God. And uh, I was very shameful how I acted. And so I'm, 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 I already per I personally apologize, but I want to publicly apologize because the way I am is, is, is because of my mother. And, and it was because of her love and her commitment to who I am when it comes to uh, Jesus. And uh, that was a learning lesson that was very embarrassing. And I want to hang myself up to dry. So that way, if anybody's moving the way that I was moving, the quickest way out of that is humble yourself. And know that is your mother and uh, or your father, and that uh, you have to honor them first. That is in the commandments, um, unless they're wrong, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I have to add comedy because I'm just weird like that. <laughs> George, that was absolutely beautiful, yeah. and, and yeah. you and I are very similar. I loved my mom. I love my dad. They both have passed, but uh, I had some arguments with them that I should not have had, and it showed an arrogance on my part that was inappropriate and I had to ask both of them for forgiveness. All right, now the great African Christian, Augustine, in the fourth century, was asked, what are the most important Christian values? And he said, what are the three most important? And Augustine said, the first one is humility, the second one is humility, and the third one is humility. <laughs> Why? Because it's humility that allows us to connect and to come back together as persons. Pride drives us apart, because when I'm proud, I'm competing with George. I want a prettier girlfriend. I want a bigger Whoa. station. I want a bigger house. I want more money in a bank. I want a larger stock portfolio. It's all about, not that I have to have this much, it's just that I gotta have more than George does. Yeah. And it's that pride that separates us, that alienates us. And that's why I respect you for humbling yourself because that allows for your mom and you to come back and reconnect. And that's exactly what Jesus taught and is exactly what he modeled. I, uh, my biggest fear was my father is, uh, is, is a great man. Mm -hmm. is one of the, honestly, if I'm a quarter of the man that my father is, I'd be the best father to ever exist. Mm -hmm. And I know that. And we know that. Mm -hmm. uh, I could sit here for days and explain to you how unbelievable this man is. Mm -hmm. But me and him never really talked about Christ. He would mm -hmm. always tell me to put God first. Mm -hmm. But we just never had that conversation. And uh, I think my... Sorry, this one was tough because like when you love somebody, you want them to have the love of God mm -hmm. because you know where things are going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my biggest fear was that I separated myself from God because of my ego. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I started watching my dad reading his Bible and paying attention because he didn't see a boy that loved Jesus and wanted to express Jesus. He saw a man challenging men. And I think my father just didn't want to be challenged by his son. Mm -hmm. And so when I humbled myself in front of my mom, my king on earth saw it. And so then he drew near me. You know what I mean? He drew near to me. And uh, it's, the, it's the, the best thing I could ask for. If, uh, if God came to me right now and he says, you could only have one thing. And it's, I would want my loved ones to see more than me who Jesus is. And you could take everything else. Uh, and it, it was just an easy step of humbling myself. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. And yet, it's the hardest thing to do. Yep. It's the hardest thing to do. You have to give yourself up for other people to see mm -hmm. what they should be seeing. And the worst part is, is 
99% of the time that I had to give myself up, I realized I was the one in the wrong. And that is the craziest thing was when you're like, finally, I humbled myself. Now, how are they going to see it? And then you're like, wait a second, it was me? And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And then I have to do the chain of commandments of like of forgiveness and like go to him then go to them. Then get, and it's embarrassing. But once you practice this and you're no longer ashamed of your mistakes and where you're going, it becomes so easy to like navigate through bad habits or, or, or uh, situations. Um, a lot of people go, how do I come to God? I sin every day. And I saw this beautiful guy say this on, um, not a beautiful guy. I'm making a lot of weird gay accidents <laughs> on this podcast. I am so sorry. Uh, this beautiful thing that this man said, uh, he said, um, you don't have to uh, get clean before you get into the shower. Hmm. You, you get in the shower to get clean. And so uh, a lot of people don't want to come to God because they feel so filthy and so far away from him. Uh, but that is what made me challenge my own uh, patterns and behaviors is because I came to him as I was and he started navigating me to get out of where I shouldn't be, if that makes any sense. It totally. reminds me of when David talks about, you know, after the whole Bathsheba incident, God against only you have I sinned. And that bothered me growing up. I was like, man, you sin against the guy you killed so deceptively. You sin against so many people. And you're like, what, you, what, what in the world? But it's exactly what you're saying in terms of the chain of, the, of command because... If you understand that God forgives you after you do go to him in brokenness, then you understand that the creator of every single human being, you are asking forgiveness from them too. Yeah. And it's not that you're not supposed to go to them. It's the root. Specific. Exactly. The root of it all. It's the root of it all. One thing you guys mentioned when you were talking about this, this very issue of forgiveness. So I do, I worked at Mass General Hospital in the psychiatry department. And I personally believe that probably 90% of those who are getting serious counseling and have serious depression, serious anxiety, bipolar, and these things, if they learned how to forgive themselves and that God truly forgives them, their problems will be dealt with. It's, I, the, it's the best trick the devil could do. Exactly. You're not worth forgiveness. Right, And right. then you're like, I'm not. That's because it's true. Right. And then you're in a loop of just self-sabotage, right, and right, darkness. Right. Exactly. That's exactly right. And, and I think, too, it's the whole idea of your career can't forgive you. You know, not even your spouse ultimately can forgive you. In some ways, she can. It's only God who ultimately can forgive you and will never let you down. And so it doesn't matter how much you fail, God will still forgive you. And, and I think for me, that brought so much emotional freedom in my life Still accountability. I'm not saying I can of do course, whatever I want. Yeah. But also you're grateful. So it makes you work harder to like yeah. uh, be a better person. Right. And also it negates mm -hmm. the fact that people are like, you're only doing it to get into heaven. It's like, well, no, if you know the scripture, you would know that's not true. Exactly. None of my works are is what get, get me into heaven. It's it's strictly off the fact that I was forgiven by a king who, who has the authority to forgive me. Right. Mm -hmm. He had the wealth to pay my bill that I couldn't mm -hmm. pay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get to a, uh, another question. Okay. So we have another question here from somebody and it says... How do I find the signs that God is guiding me? How do I follow the path he is laying out? Ooh, can I answer this one? Yeah. Friggin I'll shoot from my hip right now. Yeah. <laughs> if we're going to go scripture, cursed are the ones who wait for signs, right? So you can't be looking for a sign. I think the only way to find God is the way you would find a human being, right? You have to build a relationship with and have a conversation. And if you're the only one speaking mm -hmm. and not only the other ones speak, you're never going to hear them. So I think that studying the scripture, the way that you said, mm -hmm. from starting from Matthew's on, you get to know who you even want to worship first. Don't play games. I say be honest with yourself. Read the scripture. See if Jesus is somebody you even love. Because you can't have a relationship with something you don't love. If you don't love Jesus, then there's no, there's no hope in having that relationship. I know so many people that are in relationships that don't love each other. And it just doesn't work. So I think the, 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 the waiting on a sign is, is pointless. I think that, that that's what he means by being cursed, is that you're just endlessly just going to be waiting there. I think the best way to have a relationship with God and the, the, the fastest way to have a, a connection is maybe stop talking as much and listen a little bit more. Wrong? Mm -mm. Very good. What would you say, Stuart? Yeah, I see so many Christians who are just stagnant. Exactly like you said. They're just waiting for a sign. And it never really comes. And for me, I usually counsel them saying, just take that first step. Mm. Just take the first step. And if you fail, What would fail the first upwards. step be? Mm -hmm. The first step would be if they are literally waiting. So, so sometimes we just had, not too long ago, a woman waiting to hear from God whether to move across the country or not. 
Oh, that's a great example. And she just kept waiting. And I said, well, look, pray. You were saying prayer earlier. I mean, the vast, the vast amount of the world prays. So you got to be in prayer. Then you got to be in Christian fellowship, giving you some type of guidance, whether that's family, you know, a Christian family, or add friends as well. So prayer, fellowship, the word. I don't like the whole idea where some Christians flip through the entire Bible and just kind of like put their finger down and land on something. And they're mm. like, oh, that's what, that's what God's telling me to do right now. But that's also looking for a sign. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think in the word, in the sense of growing in wisdom, like if you're in the word, it's impossible, at least in my mind, the studies that I've done, to not grow in wisdom in making the right decisions, like mm. moving, like entering a, a certain career path. Like it's just impossible because the Holy Spirit, God moves in that kind of way. So I think those, they, those they need to three. dig deep. Mm. Like yeah. I would just, it, it's, it's, way, it's way deeper than waiting for a sign. Right. Why do you want to move? Right. What's it for? Is it going to benefit you or do you know it's not going to benefit you? Is it a selfish reason? If it's not a selfish reason, there's so many more questions to why you should be moving. And I think the, the, the scripture, there's so much wisdom in it. I think Proverbs has helped me with my career more than anything. Hmm. Um, I just, I think, I, I guess the best way, for, like, I, I, just, I just don't like when people wait for a sign. For example, my whole life, uh, people are like, well, you're trying to be an entertainer, bro. That's evil. That's like in the evil world. And I'm like, well, no, I, I don't have to be evil to be in that world. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't wait for a sign. I felt something in my heart and I said, God, if this is something you want to be fruitful, let's rock it out together. And if it's far bad for me and it takes me one inch away from you, oh, I want it so far away from me that I don't even want to see it with my eyes. Um, but I work at it. And if God doesn't make it fruitful, then I'm like, okay, cool. This is something he doesn't want me to be a part of. Let me go and change my avenue. But a lot of people are like, well, it's in my heart. I'm like, well, God created your heart. So have you asked him what your heart really wants? Because four years ago, I didn't want what I want now. And a lot of people are chasing what they want so much that like, this is how I, this is like an easy way of putting it. If I have a Ferrari, I'm not taking my Ferrari into Honda and asking them, hey, what's going on with my car? I'm going to take it to the creators of Ferrari and be like, yo, what's going on on the inside? And so I go to the Bible to figure out what's going on on my insides, to figure out what it is, is what I want selfish if it's not. Like I told her, I was like, should I be walking away? I love Christ so much. I love talking about it. Should I go start my church? Or should I go start preaching? Should I go do this or do that? And I melted down. I'm like, am I in this industry because I'm selfish? And, I, and then the money is here. But then she's like, no, you turn away from money for this. And then I'm like, okay, well, what if it's the, the passion of being uh, famous? And then, uh, and then I realized one day, you know what? God created me to be an entertainer and speak. As long as I put him first in any direction I'm going, I don't find it being evil. I find it walking with God in the industry that I'm in. And not to put you on the hot seat for a second, because this is your show. I'll but cut it. I, <laughs> <laughs> but I've been, this is no flattery. This is serious encouragement, because it really has inspired me to think through things. In my, I guess in my career, it's a little easier. But yours... You know, it's like Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar's courts, right? Some people would be like, so, so we have a friend who, one was the publisher of Condé Nast or the editor and the other is the publisher of GQ, right? And so they're very similar in the sense of what they're going to be dealing with. Like they're strong Christians, but how do we think through these moral issues as we go about publishing and editing? For you, and they did something similar, you know, when you're at, you feel like the peak how did you get to the point of saying, no, I'm going to sacrifice this. I think God's calling me to sacrifice it. Are you sacrificing it because you feel the tug of God saying you're doing this for the wrong reasons? Or is it more so encroachment from the outside saying you're, you're dirt in this kind of way because you believe this, because these are your convictions. Now you have to bend towards our will or, or you're out. And if you had to decide right then and there, which... Which was it? Cause oh, easy, easy. Yeah? I have an easy answer for yeah. that. Because my mom prepped it for me when I was a kid. My mom always <laughs> knew I was going to be an entertainer. So she used to always, like, when, a, when like for example, like a Chris Pratt back in the day would, like, thank his God, right? She would pause it and make me watch it. She goes, look, he's in this industry. He didn't give up his God. Mm -hmm. And when I came here, we all as a family prayed that if it takes me one inch away from God, that we want it miles from me. So my mom used to tell people, I didn't send him alone. I sent him with God. And then, yes, you're right. I came into a place where I was like, okay, I'm obviously going to piss a lot of people off. Um, 
and maybe this direction is going to make me less famous or maybe the money's going to go or maybe this is going to go. And my mom used to smile, look at me and she goes, you're an, you're an entertainer. So I'll, I'll put it in this terms for you. When God says action, who has the ability to say cut? And so I go into any room in any industry in any way, shape or form. And I know that their master is my master. So they're not going to tell me how to run my life and they don't have any ability to crush me. And I will walk in any direction. I'll be more fruitful than you could ever imagine because my God waters my plants. Not Satan, not your opinion of me, not anything. This whole community, this whole, this whole entire Los Angeles department could go against me and I'd sit here giggling because they have no idea how great my God is. And I continue having that attitude. And uh, if there be a day that I get killed for it, if there be a day that I get removed for it, if there's a day that I no longer am here for it, it's because God wanted me out of here not because they wanted me out of here. And so I move unapologetic because I'm not apologizing for believing in Christ. And I'm going to be here if you like it or not. It's not up to you. Beautifully nice. put, George. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> now, getting Part back cut, to... Just George Jacobs show <laughs> just got canceled. Oh, no. Oh, God, I need to beat it. <laughs> getting back to that question, though, there are two examples I want to give. God, give me a sign. We have to be real, real careful with that. Why? Because I know too many guys who, when their girlfriend looked them in the face and said, I really love you, the guy said, really? Prove it. Have sex with me. And if you don't have sex with me, I don't think you love me. See, that's not openness. That's not honesty. That's not humility. That's not sincerity. That's manipulation. And so when I approach God, I better have the humility and the vulnerability to say, God, you give me the sign, whatever you want to, not what I dictate. You express and reveal your love to me as you choose not as I choose. Okay, that's in the emotional realm. Now let's go to the intellectual realm. All right, God, I can't believe on you unless you scientifically prove yourself to me. Do you realize how ridiculous and dishonest that is? What color is the note C? What? Middle C doesn't have a color. They're different categories. And if I'm going to say, unless I can see God, hear God audibly, touch him, smell him, taste him, then there's no God. I'm mixing my categories. I am demanding that a God who is spirit reveal himself physically right here, right now. That's dishonest. God is a spiritual being, so therefore to demand that I scientific or that God scientifically prove himself to me, otherwise I can't believe in him. That's mixing my categories. It's making a big intellectual blunder behind the sign of, behind the statement, I need a sign. Give me a sign, i.e., what I want is, I want a scientific proof that you exist. Sorry, God doesn't limit himself to a scientific proof. He's a spiritual being. It's intellectually dishonest to demand, God, you give me a scientific sign. Does that make any sense? Oh, of yeah, course. Definitely. Also, that falls in the category of humbling yourself. Correct. Who are you? Bingo. This is what I talk to people when they're like, well, God has to come and show himself to me. I go, listen, buddy, let's make this very clear. <laughs> if there was a king that uh -huh. ruled this whole world, yep. you have the balls to yep. stand up in front of him and being like, all right, this is, I want to know the facts of what you're running your kingdom. And this, this is what, poof, you're gone. Yep. You're dust. Yep. Like with this, you're dust. Yep. You're not going to have that same energy if he takes the form. I believe that the God that I'm going to worship is going to be so big that my brain can't even comprehend it. That's right. So I'm going to come at it as this ant is not going to comprehend my life. Mm -hmm. My dog is not going to comprehend my life. Mm -hmm. So who am I to ask God to prove it to me? No, 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 no. I'm going to worship you because I have mm -hmm. no ability to understand who you are and how great you are, but I see the effects that you cause. Mm -hmm. And I know you exist because I searched for you and I saw it in my heart. Mm -hmm. But I came humbly to see you. Mm -hmm. I know that if a God's sitting on a throne in heaven, the farthest people from me are going to be the ones that are going to ask me, hey, you come and show me. It's like, you come and show me, buddy? <laughs> you die. Like, name me the biggest famous person you know. Name him. Brad Pitt. He, when he's dead, 50 years from now, no one gives a shit about Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. Nobody gives a shit. No. Sorry for my language. <laughs> oh, wait a second. My wife uses that word, the SH word, <laughs> and she wanted me to tell you it's all right. 
Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. So, okay, so, okay. Whoa, this just spun me into a great question. Are you, you, wow. I, I love that you in here. I have a, I have a filthy Shot. mouth. I have a filthy mouth. I grew up in a very, like, Italian style. Like, it, nothing, it, I, forgive me for my next play, but nothing's funnier than fuck. You know what I mean? Like, that shit to me, like that. Like, right? Like, it's like a little spice on a conversation, right? But my heart is like, it wasn't coming from a, 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 a cursing aspect. Right, like if I was like F Reed, it's way different than I'm like I F with Reed. You know what I mean? Like it, it's it to me in my heart, which I feel God is monitoring, is reflecting what I mean by the words that I'm using. But somebody challenged me mm -hmm. and said, "Yo, you're reflecting God though." And another person sees it in a different way. You're the one that's bouncing the wrong image off of him. So. Is it okay to swear or not to okay to swear? <laughs> <laughs> one, one answer you guys give me might set me free to be like, do, 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 and then say whatever I want. <laughs> and the other one's going to give me deep problems on trying to fixing it. And, and by the way, I've been trying, and it it's hard, okay? It's really hard. So what is the correct answer? Oh. You Ephesians it. chapter 4, verse 29. Do no. not let any unwholesome talk. I'm sorry. I just I find it so captivating that you guys just look at you and go, Ephesians. Like, I, I, like, dude, that's the coolest thing to me more than anything. Because if I had that ability, if if, if a genie came out, if a genie existed, and he's like, you have one wish. It's like I wouldn't want to speak every language in the world. It's like I would want to be able to to speak to somebody using the gospel from. And by the way, I think I could. I'm getting good at remembering uh -huh. my yeah. scriptures. Yeah. But you guys are on some Jedi moves, bro. Like, <laughs> you just look at you like, okay, I'll bring up a Caesar. You say back. <laughs> And, and you say, and it's, by the way, it's the coolest thing. Like, I'm geeked out by you guys. He's so, literally I, got my four year old daughter doing this right dude, now. Dude, that's so cool. It wild. is amazing. Like, it's not wow. me, it's him. It's pretty impressive. Dude, I can't wait He's to see her in high school. He's like, come on. It's like, just, it's so let's just do it. We don't have to be married. And she's like, Ephesians 7, 8. Like, like <laughs> rejecting a man just by. That would be so cool. Uh, okay, I apologize so, for interrupting please. you. I was no just problem. Like, Paul writes, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. All right, now that's very convicting for me. What I say to my wife, what I say to my sons, my daughters-in-law, my grandchildren, had better be building them up. Yeah, but what so, if the swearing is like building up in a yeah, funny way? Good point. Good question. I want to know. Well, I like the way you think. You're thinking through issues in an honest, <laughs> good way. And that's what we got to do. That's okay. what we got to do. Thank you. But I can promise you, when I lose my temper with people, even with students on college campuses, that's, that's not good. And I have to apologize. I'll never forget being on a campus down in conservative Mississippi. <sighs> Love the setup, by the way. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> this one guy comes walking down the sidewalk saying, Oh, here's another one in them conservative, narrow-minded, bigoted Christians telling us we all need Jesus. And boy, I, I was beginning to boil. And I said, well, well, come on, let's talk, man. He wouldn't talk. He just walked right into the student union and ignored me. And I said, all right, God gave all of us two ends, one to sit on and the other to think with. Our entire future depends upon which one we use. Heads you win, tails you lose. One went to the back of the crowd, raises her hand and said, uh, ask me, would Jesus have said that to that guy? So it's hard. Wait, what was wrong with that? Well, obviously I was telling him, you're not he thinking with your brain, him. you're thinking with your butt. Whoa, my, my guy, <laughs> let me tell you something. We're very different. We're very different. I, I was thinking you were going to... to <laughs> I don't know if I'm like not intelligent, but I didn't even see that as an insult. I'm like, I get it. Heads or tails. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just dumb, but like I thought you were gonna—I thought you were gonna be like, "Oh man, I can't even say what I thought you were gonna say." <laughs> Hold on, he's not that prudent. Holy, one second, one second here. Let's just clarify the top ten swear list that you have that me and my brothers have come up with. Well, so some of them are old school that I—they're I, too old school that they're politically incorrect, and he didn't know it. <laughs> Shoot, son of a gun. You gotta, you gotta help me here. Those are, we wait, are those up, bad we words? Those are his bad words. And we know that they mean more. No, 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 George, I'm saying they mean more than that. You know what I mean? He just goes out there and he yells them. It's like, come on, what's, what's behind that? It's the same thing wait, as what wait, you're saying. Wait, Reed, what, what did we think he said? Remember when we were watching his thing? And what did he say? What do we think he said? And then he was like, baloney. Baloney, that's it. No, no, but, but, but what was it before? What was it? 
it, oh, dude, we thought you said the F word, <laughs> and we both paused it, and we're like, whoa. Oh, yeah. And then immediately I was like, see, you could say the F word. And then, and then he goes, baloney. And then, he, and then Reed points out, he goes, I don't think a man that says the F word follows it up with baloney. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we had to, what was the word? It was like a. It, it wasn't, it was something that's. Ended with up, but it started with something else. It wasn't the F word. I forget what it was. But it was something else, and we were just dying. Maybe I don't know. Oh man, I don't know what it was. It was something. We we put the subtitles on to see what you said, and we're like, oh, it wasn't the F word. But I just found that real. Okay, so swearing's bad. So is it the word? Okay, so is it the word like F U C K, or is it? The intent behind it, because you say he's a son of a gun, right? So mm -hmm. is it is son of a gun just as bad as F U C K because you had the same intent behind the no, word? You're, you're spot on. It's the heart. The heart's the first issue. Oh, just my as you heart's both fine have said. when I say okay. the bad words. <laughs> right, but then, well, then it's secondly, true. it's true. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not even <laughs> trying to defend myself. I'm not trying to defend myself. I just thought I was representing God the wrong way because other people could take the word that I'm saying right. in a bad way. That's right. What if I have a sign that says nothing I say. <laughs> Comes from, I'm just trying to find a loophole because stand-up comedy is so hard when it you don't is. swear around. It is, it is. You're it is right. so hard. You're right. And it slips out, and then I hate when people are like, he's not a Christian, and I'm like, No, oh, that's judgmental. That's baloney, as you baloney. would say. Baloney, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's, not, that's not a sign that you're not a Christian because you use language, no. I mean, listen, they say uh, the term is don't, uh, he swears like a sailor or a yes. fisher. Simon was a fisher. Yeah. Do you think he swore a lot? I don't know. I do know that in uh, Galatians. Paul, Paul, yeah. Paul, for sure. That's right, Paul. In Galatians, Cut talks about your... all our good works are like dung. The S-H word. He swears? He well, he's S-H word, word yeah. and dirty, you know. What's dung? 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 Dung, D-U-N-G. It's the same thing as shit. Oh. It's horse dung. It means it's horse dung. Well, then he goes as far to say, I wish that they would cut off their... Testicles. Their leg, yeah. Yep. Right. Emasculate so themselves. He, yeah, he goes far. Paul's a bad dude, a though, bro. Here, Paul's got. a bad dude, bro. You're right. I'm like Paul, guys. Just imagine they're like, this guy compare himself to Paul. Uh, I have had professors though, Christian professors. I had two of them, really, really sharp guys. They both said to me, cursing's fine, especially if you're with non-believers and it's going to make you more approachable. No, them. that's why I do it. So I it's, oh my, I hey, see. Jessica, don't even give me that look. Listen, listen, <laughs> listen. I'm not what, saying that's my no, position. No, 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 no. <laughs> Just to make Jess, sure. Jess, I swear, I swear. One time, I'm, I, and she sees it and Reed sees it. When I'm talking to people and I can see they're tuning out, I would say, please forgive me, right? Please forgive me, because I feel way different swearing in front of you guys. Uh, <laughs> but if I'm like, it's fucking horse shit, right? And they look at me like, whoa, what? And then now they're like leaning in because I'm speaking their language. Right, and right, I'm not coming right. from like a, I'm holier than you. Right. Because let's face it, bro, I swear all the time and I'm trying to work on it. So why am I taking it out now when I know I could communicate with you better? Right. I like your point of view. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You're going to get drilled in the comment section because nobody's more Christian and holy there now than the comment section. Right? Like, <laughs> they will come after you. Uh, okay, let's go to another question. Yes, I'm see. having such a blast, by the way. Oh, it's great. So are we. Let That's me know when you guys want to leave because you're not leaving until you guys are ready to go. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's from somebody. So how does God make the island boys rich when there are starving kids? All right. It's wrong to think that because a person is making a lot of money, God is blessing them. We live in a world of cause and effect. We live in a world of chance. And some people make a ton of money in some very immoral ways. And that does not mean that God is blessing them. It means they're shrewd, probably. They're also lucky, very lucky. And it points to the unfairness of life. Some of the most Christ-honoring people I know are struggling with poverty, and it's tragic. Second point, Jesus Christ commands us as his followers to be generous, very generous. And to be honest with you, that's one of the hardest ethical questions in my life. I was speaking at Harvard, and a student stepped out of the crowd and said, uh, you know, Cliff, you got it so easy. Every time you need to make a difficult ethical decision, you just go running to your magical book, the Bible, and there God tells you how to live your life. I, as an atheist, I have to existentially struggle through difficult ethical questions. I looked that student in the face and said, you got to be kidding me. My wife and I are building a house right now. 
In light of the fact that people are starving to death today, and in light of the fact that we have the solution for that starvation, give money to buy food to feed those starving kids, am I supposed to buy this kind of appliance for my house or that kind? Does the Bible tell me whether to go out and buy a Kenmore or a Westinghouse dishwasher? How much money am I supposed to spend in my car? And if you think I go running to my magical book, the Bible, and there God tells me to get a Kenmore dishwasher, or to buy this type of car, or to buy a used car instead of a new car, you're crazy. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible calls me to enter a relationship with Jesus Christ, and to pray for wisdom, and to pray that he changes my heart so that I become more generous, and I give more away to feed starving people. And yes, we do have the solution for starving. It's called give money to buy food, to bring it to kids, to put it in their mouths so that they also have a better future. And Christ commands us as his followers to do that. And I love this Syracuse professor who was an atheist, and he did a study of those who give the most. He was really excited to show that it was really secularists that give just as much money as any Christian does. To his horror, he found out that people who go to church regularly who believe in Jesus Christ and who take the Bible seriously are by far and away the most generous people in our culture, in our country. I'm amazed that he produced the book, that he allowed it to be published because it contradicted what he thought, which was, oh, no, 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 it's us secularists, it's us humanists who really give the most away. No, it's not. The facts are, it's followers of Christ who go to church on a regular basis, worship God, love people who are the most generous when it comes to giving money to help hurting people. Now, I got to give more. And that's one of the biggest challenges in my life. And to be honest with you, that is one of the hardest ethical questions for me. How much do I keep? How much do I give away? Right. But doesn't it tell you specifically like 10%? Yes, the word tithe is in the Bible. And yet it's an Old Testament idea. Jesus repeats it once in the gospel. And in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul talks about God loves a cheerful giver. And Paul talks about giving generously. So 10%, I think, is a good place to tar start, George. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I better be giving 10% away. But by gollies, I better be giving a lot more than 10% in light of the fact that I live in one of the wealthiest, the wealthiest nation in the world, and there are so many people less fortunate. And I can promise you, when I went to Haiti and worked with some college students to build a school, and I began meeting some Haitian Christians, I was blown out of the water by the incredible humility, generosity, hard work, and faith of these incredible people. I think for you to say you don't worship money, it has to come with, uh, with actions. You can't just say it with your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 a lot of people look up to their ball players. A lot of people look up to the rappers. I like the way Jesus rocked, man. Like he had, mm -hmm. he had the king and the earth, and I mean, heavens and earth, and yet he didn't want any jewelry. He rode in on a donkey. Like the guy was humble. And mm -hmm. so I want to practice that because I think it comes with good, uh, a good path. A mm -hmm. uh, 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 easier heart to live by. I'll be, I'll be vulnerable on one spot. There was a deal that I had that could have changed my life forever, and it was a gambling deal. Um, and I know, notice a lot of people are gambling, but I lost a lot of family members to to gambling, and I saw how it broke the the home. So how could I accept something and promote it to a home where I've watched with my own eyes it break it? I know a man that I grew up with that took his life. Because he was in so much debt, he was embarrassed to be around his father. Hmm. And you want me to promote it? Good for you, George. I can't. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm, by, the, I'm by the way, I didn't bring this up to just be like, look at me. No, no. All I'm saying is don't look at your bank account and don't look at the money coming in and out as your lifeline. If you're doing that, you're worshiping money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the lid and poison the rest. And that attitude is far too prevalent in our culture. And you've just expressed the opposite. And that's exactly what Christ calls us to. It's exactly right. I think that money is a real good thing in the Bible in terms of Job had it, mm -hmm. Abraham had it, so many of the, the leaders had it. Mm -hmm. yep. And yet there's something specific. you got the eye of the needle. you got so <laughs> many other examples of how hard it is for people to get to heaven who have a lot of money, mm -hmm. because there's something poisonous about it, despite how great it is. You know how they say uh, slavery is in the Bible and it's promoted as the Bible. It's like slavery was okay. What, how do you guys argue against that? It's interesting you raise that because you're right. At uh, University of Texas, Austin, and some other schools, there were a bunch of very well-educated students and grad students who really pounded on that. And their whole point was, 
the reason you cannot trust the Bible is because it advocates slavery. Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. The second greatest miracle of the Old Testament was what? The Exodus. What's happening in the Exodus? God is delivering the Hebrew slaves from slavery in Egypt. Well, well, but there was slavery that was recorded in the Bible. Yes, that's right. There's slavery that's recorded. There's polygamy that's recorded. There's rape that's co- recorded. There's murder that's recorded. Never is the Bible saying these are good. Yeah. Rather, the Bible is helping people living in a corrupt, depraved culture learn how to deal with it. Exodus chapter 21, verse 16. You've got to read it. It says very clearly, if you kidnap someone and are caught with them in your possession or having gotten rid of them and sold them, you must be put to death. Death penalty. Mm. You kidnap somebody and you're caught with them in your possession as your slave or you've sold them to somebody else, you are to be put to death. Now, when you get to the New Testament, you're in the Roman Empire and over 50% of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Doctors were slaves, lawyers were slaves, business people were slaves. It was like indentured servants. Were some of those slaves mistreated? Tragically, yes. A lot of those slaves, though, were treated very respectfully. Now, when Paul says, slaves, obey your masters, what he's doing is he's not saying that slavery is good. But he is saying, Christians, do not follow Spartacus and cause a slave rebellion in the Roman Empire, because that's really going to mess things up. Instead, respect your masters, but understand that freedom is best. How do you conclude that? Because Paul wrote a whole letter. It's at the back of the New Testament called the letter of Philemon. The whole point of the letter is, Philemon, you have a slave who ran away. I met him in prison. I led him to Jesus. I'm sending him back to you. But I ask you to accept him back no longer as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. And when you study the abolition of slavery around the world, usually it is motivated by followers of Christ, like William Wilberforce in the British Empire, like Frederick Douglass here in the United States, who understood biblically all human beings are created in the image of God, therefore to enslave someone is absolutely evil. And they fought against slavery for the abolition of slavery, and they succeeded. Why? Because Jesus Christ and the Bible teach that no man, no woman is inferior to anybody else. Why? Because God created all of us in his image. So, slavery is wrong. Yes, there were certain cultural challenges, like polygamy, that Uh, had to be handled. Polygamy is multiple wives, yeah? Correct. Okay, Mm -hmm. gotcha. And when did that stop being a thing? Because I heard that like King David had multiple wives, but didn't God not want that to happen with David? Exactly, George. Yeah. Because in Genesis 2.24, we read, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two shall become one. Not the ten become one. Not the 20 become one. Solomon, 700 wives, 300 concubines. No, not the thousand become one. The two become one. That's marriage. That's Genesis 1 and 2. But then Genesis 3, we have the fall, where human beings say, we got a better idea. We're going to run our lives our way. It's pride, not humility. And God says, because I've given you free will, you are free to go. And polygamy resulted and slavery resulted. And those are two horrible abuses of the gift of life that God has given us. I love the line of... Abolishing slavery, which is what the Christians did, Wilberforce, Frederick Douglass, yep. which he got out of slavery. But even before then, every single civilization had slavery. Mm-hmm. It was supernatural to start to abolish slavery. My favorite line, supernatural, because Christians are always like getting hit for, oh, you believe in the supernatural. I mean, that's kind of more normal these days, but they get picked on for it, right? Mm. But it's really supernatural that they came in mm-hmm. and abolished slavery and did away with polygamy and these kinds of things because... Mm-hmm. It was natural to do these things, even from an evolutionary perspective. It's natural to have slaves. It's natural to have numerous wives. Like the Me Too movement came out of Christianity. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so it's, a lot of you know, what's so funny is uh, I've noticed the pattern of humanity is they blame the people that set them free. Bingo. Yeah. They blame yeah. the people that set them free. For example, a yeah. uh, uh, man back in the day when I was growing up in the old days. <laughs> When a man ran the house, oh, the man. old days. Uh, it's now disrespectful. Do you have any idea what my dad sacrificed to be the man of the house? And now you're going to smack him in the face of disrespect. Oh, you think you're the man of the house? How about this? You be the man of the house. 
<laughs> it's work. It's <laughs> sacrifice. Dude, I make jokes all the time. We're not equals. I run this household, but God runs us. So if I'm out of line, man, he's going to smite me in a way that I promise you I'm going to correct myself. But if there's a fire and our children are in there, I'm not going to look at it. Babe, let's equally decide who's going to go in the fire. No. Sit here. If I die going here, that's on me. You're not going to risk your life. There's no reason for you to risk your life. I am the one who's going to go into the fire. Now you're going to get mad at me for being the guy who goes into the fire? That's ridiculous. And also, I don't argue with fools anymore. That's my new thing. If, if, you're, if you're arguing with me over some foolish things, which, by the way, our, 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 our situation nowadays is just a... This is what my dad told me. He goes, you know your, your, your country's in a good place when we fight over things that are ridiculous. We're in a good place. You get what I'm saying? Like, you, you're just making up stuff to argue about now. My dad is like, you know what we argue about? Freedom. That's what we argued about. My dad used to get literally beat up in his block if you would explain that he followed Jesus. If he was like, hey, who do you, who do you worship? And they were like, yeah, I worship Jesus. They'd beat him badly, bro. Badly. So when he came into this country, he goes, listen, if I ever find out you speak ill about this country, he goes, you're going to deal with me. Because I'm going to teach you the way that we deal with it in our country. <laughs> and I was like, okay, cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to get to work to help the problem instead of become the problem. Uh, let's open mm. up another question before yeah, I no, start no. getting political. Up in here, but... <laughs> By the way, I'm running for president. I don't know if anybody knows. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, all right. So somebody asked, do I need to go to church? And if so, why? I feel like church... Mo- Sorry. I feel like church... Like most churches are so corrupted. Sorry, it was worded. I, no, they did word it yeah. weird. Yeah, so yeah. do I need to go yeah. to church? And if so, why? I feel like most churches are corrupted. Stuart? Uh, so I love this question because according to the latest Harvard studies, I throw this out at people who don't go to church. I just throw the Harvard studies out because you would not expect it from Harvard, a, right. a tremendously secular school. Right. 2018, they put this study out talking about if you take your kids to church in their 20s, they have a, a 60% higher chance of well-being and happiness. Mm. And then a more recent Harvard study talked about how if you go to church, healthy church, like you were saying, it, you have a much higher percentage chance, it's like 70% chance of women getting off drugs, um, exponentially higher chance of decreasing depression, anxiety, increasing life expectancy. So I just throw hard, like, like I, you could take it from a biblical perspective, and you should eventually. Mm-hmm. But I start with these stats being like, you mm-hmm. you can't get so Harvard stressed that you can't get those benefits right. from going to like a country club mm. or some type of community center or something. Yeah. So I think supernaturally, it's it's crazy how church works like that. What if I told you you only should buy one more razor for the rest of your life? This video is sponsored by Henson Shaving. Let me just get right to the point. As a man, as a Middle Eastern man, as a hairy, I grow by the minute man, this razor is the greatest razor you're ever gonna buy because this frame, zero plastic, and it's it's promised to last decades, if not a lifetime. Also, you're probably wondering, well, George, I can't use the same razor over and over and over. No, stupid, you can't use the same blade over and over. In the sponsorship, you get 100 blades for free if you use my code Janko. But also, just remember guys, after you even run out, the spending on a blade with this company is going to be anywhere from 3 to 5 bucks a year. And I don't know if you guys have ever remembered how much you spend on those razors. <laughs> They're like, what, 30 bucks for something you're going to use for like a week? And if you drop it on the shower floor and it's gross and you're like, I don't want to use the plastic, looks weird, it's melted, it's, it's no good. It's no good. Henson Shaving. Link in the description. Code Janko. Now, back to the show. I, I have my own point of view on it. Uh, and to circle back with the, with the country standpoint, I'm yeah. going to use this. Um, say my country is a mess. Say my country is divided. And say my country is in a place that I'm not happy with. I could either be a man who looks around and be like, wow, there's a lot of work to get done. Or I could be like, nah, I don't want to be a part of this country. Screw this country. This country's whack. This country's stupid. And, and then now you're just a part of the problem that you are running away from. Uh, if your home and your church is divided, what makes more sense to you? To run away from it because it's corrupt or to start... And by the way, this is, this is a lot of people are going to be like, well, how could you? It is not a sin to question the man of cloth. I don't think it is. If you think your priest is out of line... Like, I'll give you an example. There's an Assyrian <laughs> church that I, like, I go to. I don't, I don't think they're good with money. I, think I don't think they're bad people. They're just not good with money. So what was the, the decision? People stopped donating to the church. And I turned to my mom and I go, that's heartbreaking. 
Why would your people stop giving to your church? Why don't you start figuring out what the problem is and get mm -hmm. to work? Maybe the guy counting is dyslexic. I don't know. Maybe the guy doesn't know how to invest. I'm not trying to poop on anybody. But if there's a problem and you're like, well, no, I'm not, I'm just not going to be a part of it. And it's just like, that's kind of a brat standpoint. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, that's, yeah. that's, that's not humility. If mm -hmm. you think that you're going to walk into a perfect church, send me the address. I would yep. love to attend. Yep. <laughs> but I know that there's in that same church that people are not donating. I know that there's a lot of good people that love Christ and they want to do good and they're trying their best. But nobody wants to say, hey, why don't we gather together? And also, I wanted to circle back to this Bible verse. When two or more gather in my name, I am present. I was explaining to somebody that this is how I see it. I believe that when God explains how you pray, it should be alone, right? But that doesn't mean he's not with you. I think he is with you. I think when God says, when two or more gather in my name, I am with them, I think it's holding them accountable. I think if you're mm -hmm. going to say something for God... But then Cliff is like, whoa, whoa, that's against biblical form. And he flips to the scripture. I think God could work more with more people united discussing their point of views and using the scripture. Is that how the Bible verse was intended? Or Yes. No, and it, 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 answers, it answers that question Call mom now. <laughs> hey, Siri. Call mom. No, no kidding. All right. I can't see God. Neither can you. I can't hear God's voice audibly. Neither can you. Yeah. It's a very personal thing. Very deep thing. But guess what? I need you. You need me. That's what the church is. The people of God who want to get to know an unseen God who doesn't speak audibly so you can hear him. He speaks deep within our spirit, within our heart. And yet that can be confusing. That can be unclear. That's why we need church. To hear God speak to us through other believers who we build friendships with, who encourage us, who teach us, who hold us accountable. Now, the proof of what Stuart was saying earlier is that church really does help us tremendously. Tyler Vanderweel is professor at Harvard School of Public Health. So he's tip top of the academic world. Are you at fact Harvard. checking me right now? Hey. He has shown. He has shown. Tyler Vanderweel has shown that the, when you go to church regularly, the mortality rates go down 20 to 30%. You lead a healthier life. To regularly attend church services, you're more optimistic, you have lower rates of depression, lower rates of suicide, you have greater purpose in life, you are less likely to divorce, you are more self-controlled. Now, are there problems with churches? Absolutely yes. So find a church where it's not just a hypocritical country club. Instead, find a church where people are genuinely seeking to know Christ. They fear God. Bingo. Mm -hmm. I think then that's the most important. And I think people are so scared to say that as Christians. They're like, well, that leaves a bad taste in their mouth. It's like, no, it's not. Listen, I, I don't fight what God put plain and simple. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. If yes. you don't fear a God, you're going to not fear him and make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. I think I want a church that is stressing that they want to make sure that they're in the right path of God. Mm -hmm. So find a church that fears God. Bingo. So when someone says to you, religion is bad for you, look them back in the face and say, okay, drugs are bad for you. Whoa, 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 time out, time out. There's a difference between cocaine and life-saving medication. So that's true of medicine. It's also true of church and religion. There is religion that's highly destructive. And most of us have been burned by religious hypocrites. Mm. But in the same way that you don't go to cocaine, instead you go to life-saving medication, you go to church, but you find one that fears God, that stands in awe of God, like you said so beautifully, George. You go to a church where they're not self-righteous, arrogant twits who say, I'm better than everybody else. Hope you can be as good as I am. No, the church is Christ's hospital where broken, sick people like me are being healed by the grace of God, by God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm. Yeah. And for somebody who is wondering, you know, maybe what the first step is, would you say that it would be more important for them to find the relationship with God on their own by studying their Bible or more important for them to go to a church and kind of start there? Both. Great question. Both. You got to do both. This guy has been used by God to encourage me, to challenge me, to build me up in the faith, and I'm his father. But God has spoken directly through him to me. So 
I need to study the Bible, pray on my own, but I also need to get together and build meaningful friendships like I have with Stuart, but also like I have with a bunch of wonderful, awesome men and women of faith at Grace Community Church in New Canaan who are just wonderful people, and God speaks to me through them. Mm. But once again, that requires humility, as you were saying, George, mm. because if I'm not humble, no, 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 I got it all together. I don't need you. I, I thank you. I just do it on my own. Mm -hmm. And that, that's baloney. That's totally baloney. Prideful to think that you know more than the other, and like, yeah, I don't need your advice. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That, that's the reason why um, when people are like, why don't you start your own church or your priest or whatever, like yeah. preach. I'm like, bro, I'm so far away from that. That's so much weight. They say that it's better for you to tie an anchor to you and throw yourself in the deepest <laughs> part of the ocean than to speak God's word wrong. Hey, man, I do that every day. I don't think I'm equipped to be leading sheep when I'm a bad man myself. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they like that one, huh? <laughs> That was on the fly, huh? Maybe I shouldn't be a comedian. Here, let me find another question. I think, well, the church, too. While you, while you look, I have one more for you guys. But go, please. I, well, I, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but it's pretty big on TikTok right now. There are a number of accounts, at least, that have come, by, come through my feed where people are really pushing, oh, don't go to church. You, you know, like you were saying, mm -hmm. the, the priests are bad, the pastors are bad, and plus... There's just no, there's no point waking up on a Sunday morning. You have your Bible. Just focus here. And they're speaking ill of the church. Yeah. That's why, that's why it's a good question. Mm -hmm. It's relevant right now. Wolves yeah, disguised yeah, yeah. as sheep, my friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wolves disguised as sheep. Hey. It's so easy. Listen, it, 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 if it's too good to be true, it's probably not true, right? So if it's like, yo, you could do it all on your own. It's like, well, then how did God's people fail? You know what I mean? Right. They got verbatim an audible message from God, and they still got it wrong. You think you reading yeah, right, a Bible right, right. that was translated eight times, like that. you're not going to figure it out, man. You need help. Mm -hmm. I go online and I like, if I read one Bible verse, like just a paragraph, that would take me two hours because then I'll go and see it from his point of view. And then I'll see it from his point of view. And then I'll see a translation and then I'll sit there and I'll ponder. But most importantly, I'll ask God for wisdom, which is the Bible. But most importantly, I need understanding of it. You could have all the wisdom in the world, but if you don't understand it, it's pointless. It's like mm -hmm. you could have all the money in the world, but if you don't know how to spend it, it's pointless. Mm -hmm. Um, so I would, you know, you are who you hang out with. And if you hang out with people that pretend they got it all together, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to sit with a man who claims like you guys, like, I don't know anything and I'm a sinner. That's the man I want to hang out with because now I know you got it. Yeah. When you're measuring your, uh, uh, mental strength against God and you humble yourself and be like, I'm dust. Then I'm like, that's the guy I could get along with. Not the guy who's like sipping coffee, who probably propped up his phone and shot for three hours explaining and then editing on TikTok why I shouldn't go to church. Hey, buddy, go find Jesus. <laughs> well, isn't it? Uh, it was a uh, true understanding doesn't come without the reverent fear of God. Mm -hmm. right? Exactly Look right. You, dog. Uh, yes. this, I don't know. I was in my head from what you said. So I got a question strictly for me. And by all means, go deep on me and beat me up if you need to. Because this is a demon that I've been trying to fight for a long time. I, um, I can't get out of things that I love, right? Thank God I love things that God loves, so I, I'm very easy with a lot of things I could do. But, for example, there's a lot of stuff I mess up on, and the problem with it is I don't listen to people around me to do what I do, right? I listen to my heart. But what happens if my heart's leading me in the bad direction? So, taking that vertical up, marijuana. I, uh, I don't drink. I, I don't drink because I lose control of myself. And not just me, everybody. If you go to the club, when you see people drink, I know this sounds, I might get clipped for this. When I see people at the club and drinking and stuff, I, I don't like being at clubs because I, I, I look like I'm with a lot of demons. Just doing it. Guys just looking to see who they could smash. Girls are just completely blacked out. They have boyfriends at home. Like oh, When I'm around these things, I feel like my, my skin's about to explode into fire. So I'm like, okay, I don't like drinking out with people. It's just they're not at their best quality state of mind, and I don't want to be a part of that. When I smoke weed, though, I'm giggly. I am stupid, but I do have a firm grasp of what's kind of going on here. Um, at night, I like to partake in one or two joints. Now, for you good men, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's <laughs> ripping a bong is grabbing a plant from God's earth, right? So uh, is it wrong for me to unwind afterwards and, and, and rip a bad boy? You know what I mean? Like... Uh, Get as high as my God could possibly take me. Oh, man. my God. No, dude. <laughs> I'm going to ask it in a blasphemous way because I want to relate to other pagans like yeah. me. Okay? No, this <laughs> is such a good thing to, like, you know, to ask and to know. Well, I'm going to ask it the way that I feel. Listen, God created it. Yep. 
I just light it on fire and it acts me up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know, is it bad? And am I considered a drunken fool if I do this? It's so, That's such an interesting question because, so I have relatives now, you know, CBD oil mm-hmm. and all, it, 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 so it depends on the grade, right? No, I get pretty high, bro. You, you go way further <laughs> no, no, no. than exactly. CBD is what here, I right? take to calm me down, bro. Like, I'm talking. <laughs> and just like I'm just sitting there watching and then and then gluttony. Oh, God, gluttony is such a bad thing. I got pizza and ice cream. Listen, do I think God's proud of me? No. But is it something that's going to cast me away into hell because I keep practicing it? Um, and I, I love it, man. I like smoking and chilling in my house and I feel like it's more beneficial than me. You know, like, yeah, a, that's true. do you get what I'm saying? And so yeah. I just, I'm trying to find my way into the acceptance of it. And if it's wrong, I'll try my best to stop it. And if it's right, we're lighting one right now, baby. <laughs> we're going to get Cliff on it right now. First time ever. <laughs> He's going to jump off the cliff if he smokes what I have. <laughs> Cliff, Cliff, he doesn't drink alcohol. He never has, but we got him on a boat once and he thought Mike's hard lemonade was just lemonade. No. And he was just, oh, no. when he hits you lemonade, he just goes. <laughs> well, you know what? Jesus turned water hey, into wine. That's thank a, you. He turns up. And the gallons, you. the amount of that was supposed to be just insane. No, nah, like, absolutely. No, nah, no. Nah. Like, people back the, in the day, they're like, yo, Jesus is here. We, we got <laughs> right, the good right, stuff. Right. Like, I don't know if that's bad. I'm sorry. I was trying to make a joke. I'll let you give your poison ivy ah, illustration. Right. But wait, wait. Let, let me just say go, this go. one thing. I, it's of the earth. I'll, I'll let you take that. Boom. But, I, you know, I th- I think it gets, just gets to that point. It is healthier than alcohol, a lot of people say let's now. Let's go. Let's go. And so, I, you know, I've done some conch. Conch? Conch? Out of the shells in Costa Rica? You smoked? Well, you yeah, smoked? It's been a bit. Out of the shells in Costa Rica? Wow. I got to move out of here. Maybe it'll be a little more consistent. We wouldn't be able to push back against it here. This is going to get clipped. The whole church is going to be like, you guys get stoned? Are you dreaming of Mike's heart? It's over for you guys. The internet's coming for you guys. So, so it's the whole matter too. Well, something connected. DMT, psilocybin. Whoa, buddy. Whoa. It's whoa, fascinating. Where did he go? Have you, you went to acid? Seen, <laughs> you went to acid? Have you seen that like 40% of hard atheists became theists after these trips? 100%. Like, how do you explain that? Because it goes... And it's God using the, that? It, so even though I, it's so unhealthy? I, I agree. And I also... It's like... Okay, this is... Oh, okay, now we're really <laughs> I diving in. Trail. This is how dancer? I explain it to my mom and dad, right? So first of all, just to let you know, I might be a pansy for this. But when I was about to smoke weed, I sat my parents down first. And I wanted to make sure it was okay with them. I was having a really hard time sleeping. I had insomnia. And the doctors are like, yo, let's pop pills like Whitney Houston. And I said, no, fam. I'm not okay with that. And my mom said, nah, smoke weed, but I'm not proud of it, but I'd rather you smoke weed than do drugs like that. And I was like, okay. And then uh, I was smoking and I, and I explained it this way. You have a hammer. You could either build a beautiful home with it or you could kill people with it, right? It's how you use it. Um, mind you, how I've been using it is not the right way. But <laughs> is this God's plan? And are we allowed to use it? Because is, isn't there a scripture? But this is such a stoner scripture that like <laughs> <laughs> can't wait. That <laughs> if, if like every herb was for us or something like that. And that's yeah, the one is- I don't remember, by the way. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's cursed, by the way, right I now. Know. That's well, a curse. Well, this is cheese. Keep it clean. Come on, buddy. <laughs> We're talking about God here. What's wrong with you? Jessica, get my bong out. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so what, what is your... All righty. First point. Some people say to me, well, God made it, so why don't you smoke it? Well, yeah, God made poison ivy. Please don't suck on it, okay? We live in a messed up world. Everything's been cursed. Everything's God created a good world, really good. But then th- when we rebelled against God, nature got cursed. Everything got cursed. We live in an unfair, messed up world. So we got to be wise. We got to be shrewd. So, no, just because God made something doesn't mean I need to smoke it or suck on it. Mm. Okay? I need to be wise. Second point. Ah, oh, Cliff, no, 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 no. There is no way you should be drinking alcohol. Whoa, whoa. The first miracle that Jesus performed was turning water into Coca-Cola. No, <laughs> no way. But was can we pin that real quick? <laughs> Wasn't that because he was honoring his mother and he was showing that you must honor your mother? Because, sure. Because he referenced mm. and he said, woman, it's not my time. Good point. Ver- I like the way you read the wow, scriptures, deep. George. That's awesome. All right. But but if it was about marijuana, I'd be leading you out. Like, <laughs> Keep going. All right. So let's be real honest. There is nothing wrong with drinking wine. Jesus turned water into wine. So come on. 
but he did warn against drunkenness. So what is the definition of drunkenness? Good question. I do not know. I've heard it defined so many different ways. It's incredible. <laughs> why would you lead me? I thought you had a magical answer, man. I was, so, I was like, let's go. <laughs> but let me tell you why I don't drink. I don't drink because the guys I played ball with got her drunk, and then they did anything with her sexually they wanted to do. Mm. That's crass manipulation. Mm. That's using a person. Fair enough. That's why I don't drink. But I think, okay, you, you, you rock it up on the booze. It's not my thing. I like to smoke because I feel like I could at least... I know people that smoke and do their job. Mm-hmm. I have very bad ADHD, so it calms me down. Yeah. So I do look at it as a point that um, it, it relaxes me, it unwinds me, and I could fall asleep. But I also feel like it's a cop-out because I just want it. Yep. So I wanted to know biblically what is the limit to marijuana if right. it's okay, if it's not okay. If you do this one more time and you don't have the answer for it... <laughs> 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 All right. It's real simple. George has... One body. Yes. You don't have a spare in the trunk. Mm-mm. Your body is a beautiful gift from God. Amen. Take good care of it. Of course. Use the best science, the best medicine you can. Take good care of that body because you don't have a spare. Mm. And as a pastor, I have to sit beside the hospital beds of people who are dying from lung cancer, from smoking, cigarettes. Yeah. That's, that One has a lot of crap. Painful in way to go. Yeah. yeah. One painful way to go. Please, guys, don't smoke. Smoke cigarettes? Right. Yeah. Don't smoke, or don't smoke anything that's going to harm your lungs. Does marijuana harm your lungs like that? No, I don't think it does. Good. Great. It takes longer probably okay, to okay. harm oh, your oh, lungs oh, than oh. cigarettes, but you're still putting smoke in your lungs. You can, you can. It's proven that it affects your brain. It's proven with brain scans that it affects your brain. It builds holes in your brain. Because when you smoke, blood rushes from your brain to your extremities. That is hurting your body. Well, yeah, just if I do cartwheels, it hurts my brain. But that's what he said. He's like, don't do anything that will hurt your body. Well, Smoking but here's the thing. Effect. If I'm, okay, well, well, I'm not even trying to make excuses right now. What happens to the people that over, overwhelm themselves with thoughts at night? And they get anxiety. Mm-hmm. So is it worse for you to sit there with anxiety or for you to just smoke and watch Spongebob? A little wine for the stomach, Paul said, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I'm saying. It's a little, yep. It's just a little relaxer. Mm-hmm. I wake up every day and I kill the day as hard as I can. But at night, I don't know how to shut up and sit down. I don't. I really don't. And I'm wired up and I just want to go run and I want to do stuff. And then I sit there staring at my ceiling. But if I smoke, I could unwind. I giggle a little bit. I go to bed. And by the way, I don't know if this is blasphemous, but I am. Oh, God, I really hope I don't get reamed for this. I enjoy reading the Bible when I'm a little stoned because I could focus a little bit more. Okay, good. So, again, am I using that as an example for like, oh, I'm just trying to get away with it? Or is it like true? Because I know ball players, I know athletes, I know fighters that smoke weed every day. And yet their physical form of their body, like we were talking about, is in tremendous shape. Why? Because they're smoking it in a, in, in a volcano where it's, it's not smoking with a lighter. There's, you could eat it in a brownie. There's ways around it for it to be healthy. Cliff? Oh, yeah. That's you know true. what I'm saying? So, that's true. Okay. All right. And full transparency and vulner- vulnerability for a second. Cliff has multiple sin bins of candy in, in, his, in his room, Sugar, that's in his saying. office. Cliff, like in, in the, like, in like diabetes the is a serious thing, my I friend. I find them every now Let and then. Let me see your ankles. So now we're... All right, we're good. <laughs> Just want to make sure. And that's unhealthy, so, you know. That's it's, right. That's exactly but, right. Well, then, to just to add to that while you answer, it, then what would be the difference between one glass of wine at night versus, like, yeah, a few puffs? I could answer that. Point. I could answer that. Give it to her. One, you're, it, one is like you're relaxing and you're vibing, and one's you're straight stupid and uncontrollable. No, one glass of wine doesn't do That's that to you. That's what I'm saying. So, but if you drink a whole bottle of wine, but I said one glass of wine. you yeah. act like a wild man. And by the way, wine is like biblically okay. So, so that's like, why don't even and, worry about wine. No, but that's why I'm giving the example. Because exactly, if I, even though it's biblically okay, if I drank a bottle of it, it wouldn't be okay. So if I had one glass of wine versus a little bit of weed. Yep. So question, if I, work, mm. if I wake up, work out, I have a great meal, I'm not eating sugar like this buddy old pal over here. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, yeah. I have a trainer, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on my work, I treat my loved ones with respect, but at yep. night I like to unwind, not with wine, because I don't like the way it tastes or makes me feel, yep. but I smoke a little bit and I unwind. Does this, is this something that God looks at as like, dude, you're, you're, you're just wild in here? Like, nah, that's, not, that's far from me. Because I, let me tell you something, I have so much anxiety because I truly in my heart don't feel it to be wrong the only thing that drives me up the wall and makes me depressed is that I feel like I'm wronging the Lord okay I do (laughs) not (laughs) no come on but here's here's what I do know okay you and I are more similar than you would imagine I wake up looking 
<laughs> no, I wasn't thinking about that. You're good looking. I know that. <laughs> um, I wake up at two or three in the morning, and the thoughts are racing. Yeah. And some of them are not good thoughts, anxiety or whatever. And I'm learning to meditate. And meditation is a very biblical thing. The psalmist meditated. And so here's what I do, what I would love for you to try and do. Start with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And there my mind goes off somewhere else. I got to go back. I force myself to go back and start and focus. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And my mind's going off another. I have to stop and go back. And I'm teaching myself to focus on Christ instead of focusing on my anxiety, my problems, my fears, the things that threaten me, my insecurities. Mm. And meditation is incredibly helpful. So the Lord's Prayer would be one example. Secondly, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Mm. And that has a way of calming me down and reminding me it's the all-powerful God who is the basis of my security in life, not my bank account, stock portfolio, or talents, or career, or whatever else. Oh, I'm not using it to, uh, to like cure my anxiety or depression. Okay. I'm just strictly off of just unwinding and enjoying my time. That's the problem. Yeah. It's, it's not like I'm using it to be like, uh, oh, I'm really depressed. Honestly, I think I get more depressed while I'm high sometimes because I'm overthinking that it's wrong. And right. then I get anxiety from that. It's yeah. truly not. It's just an unwinding fact yeah. of I worked really hard today. Yeah. I'm just trying to kick my feet up and just unwind. And that's why I find it selfish. It's not a need that I want. It's truly a want. Yes. But I get jealous because people love wine. Yeah. I don't love wine. Right. I love this. This is my avenue. Yep. Yeah. Why is it that this avenue is wrong and then this avenue is fair? Well, I think it's wonderful that you and your sister have great conversations on this topic. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> you got a good sister there. She loves you and it's beautiful to see. She gets high with me all the time. <laughs> She's like the Pharisee. She's Pharisee. She'll just act like she isn't sitting. Look at her. I'm an overachiever, where Jess. It gets to the point where it's gluttonous, right? Like, it gets to the point where, like, your whole day, okay, fine, it's a Monday. We have work the next day. There's no reason why we should be smoking two joints the day before and then we wake up groggy. We feel the effects. So the fact that, like, that's the part where I'm, I disagree with. Like, it's not just, oh, I'm just going to chill and hang out. No, it's the amount that we do. That's the problem that I, that's the problem that I, I can do. cool off with the amount that I have. You, you know what I mean? If I if I had the green light of like fully, if I fully was like, okay, this is not a sin. I just got to monitor it better. I could definitely do that. <laughs> Jessica, whoever said not, tossed the first stone. And you were throwing some rocks. It's a glass house, my friend. Uh, she loves you. It's great to see. Bro. No, this is great. In the Middle Eastern house, if you're six years older than your sibling, it's another mom. Do you know how time she's grounded me? Do you have any idea how weird it is for your sister? Like, that's it. No phone. That's amazing. I'm like, well, you can't do that. And then she pays for my phone bill, so she takes it away from me. And I'm like, okay, I don't even know what to do here. Oh, um, so we'll circle back. Maybe we rip a bong, we figure it out. <laughs> is that is that a sin? manifestation will come down? Yes, when we're doing it. <laughs> okay, so so just to circle, just to close this, just just close this chapter. Sugar is bad for you. Alcohol is bad for you. There's a lot of things bad for you. Is it like how you're monitoring in your life, and you're not letting that substance or object overcome your Ooh. life? Mm-hmm. Well put. Moderation. Hey, oh, your boy getting high well put. tonight. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Obviously, by the way, and this is true. Jessica can speak up. Reed can speak up. Bell can speak up. I always personally pull them aside. I go, "Hey, have you seen me drift off from marijuana?" As it pulled me away, and they'll, Reed will be the first one to be like, "Yeah, I think you know you don't. You're not a passionate. Or you, you wake up groggy." Bell would be like, "You're a little crankier." Jess is like, "You're stupid." And I'll be like, "Okay, cool." So like, I'll monitor. I'll ask, and I'll and I'll. And I'll weigh out their opinions, not because I care about what their opinions are, like I'm like worshiping their thoughts, but it's because I'm wise enough to know that they love me mm -hmm. and that they're going to push me in the right path. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I, I do I do hold myself accountable when I was smoking, even when I was like battling that, I would take 30 days off to make sure it's not a slaving me. But it's like, damn, bro, like I, I work so hard and I'm so passionate. I need something to unwind me. And I tried to get into cigars. 
I tried to get into cigars. <laughs> I tried to get into wine. I tried to get into all this stuff, but it's just not me. And in my mind, I'm like, why am I forcing myself into this way? It's not organic. You know what I mean? We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk later after the podcast. Let's go to another question. <laughs> okay, this one will really shift the gears. Um, someone wants to know if aliens end up being proven real how does that impact religion and how we view god project blue beam have you heard about this no Pro so they're basically saying that the, they're gonna uh stage an alien takeover and use military wars and it's propaganda right um do i believe in it i don't i don't know if anything that i hear now is real or not but i liked the question that they asked is does it debunk the bible if there's aliens what is your guys' opinion about this because to me, God's yeah. an alien, right? Isn't he? Oh. God's an alien. He's not from this earth. He created it. He's yeah. out of it. Mm -hmm. So technically, okay. an alien okay. is okay. out of this earth. Okay. Aliens, are, are, to me, is like an angel. An, an angel's an alien. He's not, he's not walking around at Trader Joe's with me. I'm a legal alien. -E no, babe. <laughs> we're going to get married and handle that, okay? <laughs> uh, Actually, I could become a citizen today if I wanted to. Because, you know, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, please go on. <laughs> so you guys got the baby? You got the citizenship? You got a lot to work with. Let's, let's get married right now. Oh, oh, baby. <laughs> okay, I'm so sorry. So, go ahead, please. For me, it still comes down. The cool thing about Christianity is it all comes down to a historical event. Whether that event happened or not proves or disproves the whole thing. Like Buddhism, Islam, a lot, you know, Taoism, a, a lot of these, it doesn't come down to historical event. I, I can't think of a single other religion that does. And so whether they're aliens or not, there could be, and perhaps they are physical and they're like humans and they're, so they do have the imprint of the image of God. But just like a lot of the tough Old Testament, like slavery questions, at the end of the day, it's just, it's moot. It, it really doesn't matter at all if the resurrection occurred. And so that's the crazy part about the resurrection. Like, was a man actually not just resuscitated? Did he come back to life? Mm. And was he God? So you're saying aliens are not aliens. It doesn't, it's a moot point. It doesn't take away from Jesus dying and coming exactly. back from the dead. Also, when I see these videos online and they're like, look how tiny you are. And then it zooms out and it's like, <laughs> this is a galaxy and this is a universe. And this is, the first thing I think of is like, look how big my God is. Because I believe my God exists regardless of how big or how small we are. So if you keep showing me how small I am, you're just showing me how big my God is. Mm. Uh, yeah, and also, it's, my yeah. God's a creator. I didn't expect him to just be like, humanity, I'm done. And I'm just <laughs> sitting back. And I would assume that the creator of all creation is probably still creating other things. So I wouldn't be flabbergasted or dumbfounded that this, uh, this God, this deity, is off creating. Mm. Doesn't make sense to me to even think otherwise. Yeah. I just hope that his other creations don't come and kill this creation. Right. Biblically, that's not going to happen. But Those yeah, I, I don't. I think that if there is aliens, I don't think it counteracts the Bible. I, I have a question actually. I mean, we can keep this or not. Keep no, this. your questions don't matter. Go to the other question. <laughs> no, no, no. We can just not <laughs> keep this. But I'm just curious what you guys think about this. Just you know, right now everything that's going on in the world, and there's been I've been seeing videos of you know they're starting to implement the the chips that are going to go in people's hands. Oh, and conspiracy ride. Let's I, go. I want to know what you guys think. <laughs> the mark and of the beast. Yes, exactly. I want to know your guys' thought on that because I actually watched a video of a gentleman who was behind helping create this chip that they wanted to use. And he's an atheist. And he said, you know, I, I was helping, trying to figure out, okay, where can we put in the body because it needs uh, the temperature of your body in order to charge, things like that. And then the team, I guess, that he was working with, you know, said it seems like the best place for it would be in, in the hand or in the forehead. And he realized, like, whoa, this sounds a lot like the mark of the beast. And it did not sit right with him. And he dropped the project and he walked away from a hole. And now he, you know, tells the story and explains it. And... I mean, now I've just been seeing more and more. I think I believe in uh, England. Yeah, I believe it is in England. They're already starting that where, you know, people have the chips in their hands and they won't allow anybody to use other currencies to buy things. Like this man was at Whole Foods and he goes, here's, you know, a dollar and 20 cents. I am taking my chips and I am leaving. And they won't, they did not want him to leave because he was not paying with the chip that is in his hands. And this is just incredibly alarming, right? And I, I want to know what you guys think about 
All right, Mark of the Beast, Book of Revelation. <laughs> Dude, you guys look like cartoon characters. So, <laughs> I got this one. Book of Revelation, highly symbolic language. It's called apocalyptic literature. For the past 2,000 years, followers of Christ have said, this symbol means this, this symbol means that, and this symbol means that. And Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist, and Joseph Stalin was the Antichrist. Yeah. It just goes on and on. Watch out. Be very, very skeptical and suspicious. I think one of the main points of the book of Revelation is Jesus is coming back again. There will be a day of judgment. There will be a real heaven and a real hell. Oh, Cliff, I can't believe you think there's going to be a real heaven and a real hell in life after death. Because if you believe that, Cliff, it makes you so irrelevant to life today. Excuse me. The roads that we keep in top condition are the roads that lead somewhere significant. Mm. The roads that lead nowhere to no place of any significance, we allow those roads to fall apart. If this road is a path to eternity, you had better, and I had better, keep this road in the best repair we are capable of. And so a follower of Christ is not someone who is so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. No, they understand we're headed towards eternity. And because we're headed towards eternity, because there is a heaven and there is a hell, I want to do the best job right now in the here and the now to make this world to be the best place to make people to be as good as they can, to encourage them to grow in compassion and kindness and injustice. That is what Christ calls us to do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Uh, Also, what a beautiful trick is to have the devil continually think it's the end of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Because then what you're going to do, you're going to get everything out of the way and you're going to freak out and you're going to be living in paranoia. If the end be tomorrow or in a hundred years from now, you shouldn't be living it differently. You should be living it in, if, I'm sorry, if you believe in Christ, you should be living it the same. I don't mm-hmm. fear that if, the, if it ends in next week, because I know where I'm going. So I'm not like, I'm not mm-hmm. panicking. Do I, am I scared of death? Of course, I'm human. I don't sure. want to die. Absolutely. But I'm not, I'm not living my life in fear of death. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm living it as how the scripture says. He says, today has its enough trouble of its own. Tomorrow, right. a word about self. That's right. So I live today with yeah. what I could do with today. Yeah. And let me tell you something. It was going to be the end in the 2000s. It was going to be the end in 2012. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was going to be the end here. And it's going to be then here. And Hitler mm-hmm. was the one who's going to kill us. And the mm-hmm. this, is, this is all propaganda. And it's all like, it's, to me, it's like, whatever, bro. Like, yeah. I don't care. If it's yeah. going to happen, it's going to happen. I'm not going to sit here and bang my head up against the wall freaking out about it. Yeah, there's nothing th- we can do about it if something's, you know... If the world's gonna end, there's nothing that we can do to stop it. Mm-hmm. So we can only enjoy the moment that we have now versus having anxiety, right? And right. ruining what we have left. But I was just curious about that because I've been seeing it a lot. And I mean, to me, like if I got told that I need to put a chip in my hand, I don't think it's really healthy. It doesn't mm-hmm. sound really healthy for mm-hmm. me. So I don't know if there's something I want to do. And Good. would you guys put the chip in your hand to pay? Whew. Probably not. Mm-hmm. I'd have to hear a little bit more. Probably, I need a little bit more uh, education before I did that. Yeah. What's so interesting though about your question too is I do think it's important to discern the times. So, like you guys were saying, definitely live your life and don't be afraid or paranoid by the times. But to discern, it's smart about chips and these kinds of things. The Book of Revelation was written to an audience that was going through tremendous suffering. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people forget that, and then also. <laughs> It was John who was really old, perhaps schizophrenic, on the Isle of Patmos. And it was added into the canon later, right? I'm not saying it's not inspired. I'm saying it is inspired, and I think it should be included. Wait, well, he was schizophrenic? No, I, I just say that. Oh, I was like, <laughs> schizophrenic. So I, was like, <laughs> I have a mental health background, and it, it looks schizophrenic, some of Revelation, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but I, no, I think he was, I, 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 no, I think he was right as rain, but I think that he also, all that apocalyptic literature it's just, it's odd to me why it was written. They almost didn't include it, right? And, and so it causes some level of, I think, paranoia is this. Because we have a friend who's, she's been trying to discern the times. She'll literally be like, two days from now, get ready. <laughs> yeah. Won't happen. Move yes. all your money to Next this. Exactly. Do this and blah, blah, blah. She told me not money. to have a baby. She said, don't have another kid. I was like, yo, <laughs> but look where it led. Uh, yeah. The stop of life. Right. Uh-huh. So people are exactly. scared to have kids because they're like, oh, this is the end times. Right. I just think that if it is the end of times, enjoy. 
You know what I mean? Like, what are you, what are you sitting around freaking out about? And all these people are like, listen, eat this pill, do this, because they're going to hit you with a, a nuclear thing. We got to be ready. I go, buddy, 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 buddy. If we got hit with a nuke, I want to be wiped away. I don't want to be sitting here after everybody and this guy's deformed and this baby's barking. And nah, bro, I'm out. Nah, if they're nuking, let's go. I'm the front and center of that. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't What? You want to be here after that? Nah, I'm okay. I am okay. Let's go to another question before I, I look even more crazy. It's like I brought up a pretty crazy question. <laughs> um, the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Somebody wants to know. Uh, I keep praying and praying, but I'm not really getting anything. Wow. Yeah, this, this atheist said to me, hey, I want to debate you because I've been praying. I have that really bad depression. Couldn't make any friends. And so it felt like the same praying to God as I was praying to an empty milk carton. Mm. And I said, wow, that's, that's really painful. And you know, I didn't, so I didn't want to debate him intellectually at that point. You, know, you want to connect emotionally. But a lot of the point of prayer is to conform our wills to God's. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's the real us meeting the real him. It's not, you know, you go right back to the Lord's Prayer. It's not about the ASCIIs. That's mm -hmm. like number four on the Lord's Prayer. So it's not about shooting up flares to get things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, so they get that wrong and thinking, hey, I'm not receiving anything, so there's no God. Mm -hmm. So it's the point you've been making this whole time. It's, mm -hmm. it's the humility point. It's that started after the 1500s, there was an earthquake. And then after certain tragedies, all of a sudden, so many people in the US have turned their thinking to humanistic thinking, which is I'm the center of the universe, mm -hmm. it's really individualistic, and it's stating that, God, if you don't give me all the answers, I don't believe in you, especially the one on suffering. That's the main one. Like, mm -hmm. if I'm suffering and God doesn't do anything about it, and I'm praying, there's no God. Which is crazy. It's crazy, it, yeah. If you, if you kind of peel back and look at it from an outside point of view, all of my suffering was so good for me. Hmm. Yeah. It was so good for me that uh, I needed that suffering for me to understand why I was suffering, for me to not suffer again and walk the other direction. Um, like not lessons. a lot of people could just be like, well, what about the people in another country that are starving to death? Right. I believe that God gave us free will. And there's a lot of people that are not doing anything about it. I think that if you put five people in the room that believe in God up against 150 people that don't believe in God and the world is going to get outweighed, the other people are going to probably have their own structure to the world that you're living in. So yes, there is a lot of people that are starving. No, it, it is not about God. It's about God's people turning away from the hungry people. Mm. Yep. Well, so then do you think that maybe in a question like this, would it be maybe the person, if, you know, she, yeah, she's been praying and praying and praying, is it kind of, well, praying is us talking, but then us reading the scriptures, us listening to him. And so then maybe would it be a matter of that person diving into the word and hearing what he has to say through the scripture versus only speaking. It's praying? it's a little bit of both. Like he said, when you said, is it important to go to church or read your Bible? I think it's both. I mm -hmm. think if she was praying and she's not getting any answers, I would assume yeah. she's praying alone and without the scripture. But if she was with a congregation and she was reading her scripture, I think somebody would be able to point her and guide her in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I've yet to met a man or a woman that has fully read scripture and been a part of a community and is truly lost. Anybody who's found God is very, very understanding of their positioning that they are in life. Like, for example, the people that don't have a dollar, but they're the happiest people helping at, uh, people in earthquakes. Um, I think it has to come to deep down. It has to be the soul. Uh, and I think it also comes down to the people that were like, God, have I not done this? Have I not done this? Have I not done this? And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the people that says, be away from me. You know nothing about me. Uh, it's kind of like, um, it's selfish. If you don't know him, how, does he, how do you expect him to know you? I mean, he does know you, but it's like, it's that relationship thing. It's like if I went up to you and I only wanted my needs and nothing to do with yours, mm -hmm. how much are you going to want to be a part of this relationship? It wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. I think that when all of us pray, God answers. But there are at least four answers. The first answer is no. I don't like to hear that. I want what I want. That's part of why I pray to God. Please give this. And at times the answer is no, Cliff. Second answer is slow. Slow down, Cliff. And that's real hard for me because I'm one impatient rascal. I want it now, now, now. And at times God says, slow, Cliff. Timing. It'll be my timing, not yours. Third answer is grow. 
as George was just sharing, a lot of suffering that I've prayed that I would escape. I didn't escape. And God grew me as God grew you through suffering. So the third answer is grow, grow up, Cliff. And then the fourth answer is go. Yes, here's the answer, go. So if the answer is no, and I say, well, God hasn't answered my prayer, I'm naive. Yes, God has answered my prayer. The answer is no. Mm -hmm. I might not like that, but that's what God has said. And God is God. Cliff is not God. So it's no, slow, grow, or go. Wow, what a great answer. See, those ones I liked. <laughs> <laughs> those four. The other ones I didn't. But the others. Yeah, but the other ones are honest, brother. I can't make it up. <laughs> we have people come into our church, and we do this the, the Q&A thing, and we had you know some singer come in, and her husband came up to you and said, finally, I've gotten to a church where someone says, I do not know. Because so many pastors, like you said, you got to challenge the priests. Yeah. Because so many people I know, especially growing up, turned away from the faith, turned away from belief in God, and definitely not going to church. Yeah. Because literally they were scolded for asking questions and saying, you know, a priest saying, I know, I know everything, mm. and, but don't ask me that. Mm. So that, that's why you've done the, <laughs> as frustrating <laughs> as it is, you've done that for 40 years on college campuses. Mm -hmm. That's kind of his mantra that... That was, dude, I, I had uh, people that I loved. They're like, yo, yo, don't challenge the cloth. And I go, I'll yeah. challenge anything. Like, what are you talking <laughs> exactly. about? Exactly. What? I'll challenge yeah. absolutely. He's the most I'm challenging. Right. I want to make sure he's right. <laughs> I go what? There, exactly. You know, that doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> They're like, no, no, no. You don't want God's rap. Like, I don't think God's upset with me. Like, if I came from a malicious, disrespectful place, yeah, then right, I can right. see God stepping in. Yeah. But if I'm just asking you a question, you're like, no, don't, don't question me. I'm like, oh, I pressed the hurt. I'm going to keep pressing. <laughs> right. I'm going to keep pressing until we figure out the Poke answer. That bear. Poke that bear. Right, Cliff? <laughs> you couldn't be... Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I said, I don't know about that. But George, you know, you're a lot like Abraham. Remember Abraham? Standing over the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, God says to him, I'm going to wipe it out. And, and Abraham says, says, really? What if there are 50 righteous people? Will you wipe it out then? God says, okay, no, I won't. How about 45? Okay, no, I won't. How about 40? Okay, no, I won't. How about 35? No. 30? No. 10, no. Now, why didn't Abraham go 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1? I don't know. But obviously what he was struggling with is, God, are you just? Or are you just going to rip people off? And he was arguing with God. But what's fascinating, George, is, as you pointed out, when Abraham speaks to God, he challenges, but he does it respectfully. It's not with a, I know better than you. It's like, I'm really struggling with, are you just? Or are you going to wipe out a bunch of innocent people? And obviously when God says, no, if there are 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'm not going to wipe it out. Obviously Abraham said, okay, I can trust you. Abraham was a Syrian. Was he? He came from, uh, right? I'm uh, almost 100% right. He came from... Ur of the Chaldeans, yeah. Chaldeans, yeah. Yeah, Chaldeans. Yep. There you go. A Syrian and Chaldeans, almost yeah. in the same region. Yeah. We're... Uh, I'm a Syrian, so yep. when you said you're like Abraham, <laughs> that's Abraham. right. I was like, let's go, <laughs> let's go, all to Raya, baby. Yeah, you uh, it's it's so funny that um, Assyrians have such a it, it's the when God says the hand of Nineveh uh, will rise up and judge. Do you guys know this Bible verse or no? Or um, uh, okay, let me give you give an example. Um, Jonah. When he went to go save those filthy people, mm -hmm. that was us. That's right. Assyrians. Capital of Assyria, Nineveh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were really, really, really gross people. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of my conviction uh, for preaching the word of God is that I truly think that I was given a second chance. Like awesome. My, wow. my bloodline was given a second wow. chance. So mm -hmm. uh, ironically, we were warned to repent mm -hmm. and fear God. And so I take my platform and I say... <laughs> Be warned and repent. It's a, it's a very serious game we play this life. And, yes, uh, it is. And it's so funny how a lot of people like say God doesn't exist and don't even give a second thought of reading or trying to find. And now I understand this as no eyes and ears shall hear or see unless they want to. I can't convince you mm -hmm. uh, that there's a God as much as I can't convince you there isn't a God. Um, and it's just a relationship that I love. Do you ever doubt? Like doubt God's existence or his love. Well, of, you think course, it's a good thing, or is I, it? When I was younger, I used to doubt. Now yeah. I have an abundance amount of evidence that it's like it's. Oh, it, you can't convince me that there. You have a better chance convincing me she doesn't exist than God exists. That do, God doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, wow. But I had to work to right, have that right, relationship. Right. Um, and, and let me tell you something. Just like muscles, right? I don't know if you guys probably noticed this on me. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But this <laughs> this took a lot of growth, and growth came with a lot of pain. 
But I worked it out and it was sore, it hurt, right? That was my spirituality, just like my muscles. It hurt. God had to stretch me out. And now I'm a little bit stronger than maybe a man who doesn't have a conversation with God. But it hurts, man. You can't have a conversation with the, the almighty deity that created everything and you think that everything's going to be completely fine. Like, he challenges you. And if even if he challenges you with 1% of his might, that's greater than this whole world. So, like... You're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna have that conversation with God, know that you're going up against the greatest, the biggest, the strongest. This, this guy gave a, a talk. You, you know the book Infinite Jest, David Foster Wallace. Is it a book? Big yeah. No thick book. <laughs> no. And uh, yeah. I only read the Bible and randomly Dan Bilzerian's you're, book, you're which is wildly different. Wildly different. He gave me the book. I read it. It caught my interest. I read it all in one day. Dan Bilzerian and, and Tony Robbins. That's the only books I have right there. Shout out to those guys. Uh, dude, dude, this guy was an atheist, and he shared that at Kenyon College. He gave this address. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase it. You, you got to look the quote up because it's amazing. But he basically just said, if you, everybody worships in this world. Mm -hmm. Everybody worships. So something is of most value to you. You worship it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you worship anything finite in this world, so a loved one, a career, the most, it will eat you alive. Sure enough, he hung himself. Oh. I don't know if that was connected. It probably was. Um, super creative guy. So there's probably some, I don't know, mania in there or something. But... Strong atheist saying that you have to love God supremely, or if you love something on this planet the most, it will eat you alive. And so I think what you, you know, that's why it's the beauty of your mom praying over you at night, saying, God first, then me. Oh, he, she pulled it up. I don't know if it's the right one. Though. Oh, yeah. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Yeah, that's the first. Let me see if I can get the whole. It's a long. It's a long quote. No, no, take your time. Yeah. Okay. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship, and the compelling reason for maybe so he's an atheist. Maybe choosing some sort of god to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure. And you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before your loved ones finally plant you. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. Look, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is not that they are evil or sinful. It is that they're unconscious. They're default settings. Wallace, this is, this is my favorite author now commenting on that quote. Wallace was by no means a religious person, but he understood that everybody worships, everyone trusts in something for their salvation, everyone bases their lives on something that requires faith. A couple of years after giving that speech, Wallace killed himself, and this non-religious man's parting words to us are pretty terrifying. Something will eat you alive, because even though you might never call it worship, you can be absolutely sure you're worshiping and you are seeking. And Jesus says, unless you're worshiping me, unless I am the center of your life, Unless you're trying to get your spiritual thirst quenched through me and not through these other things, unless you see that the solution must come inside rather than just pass by outside, then whatever you worship will abandon you in the end. Well, Thanks. Yeah, of course. I don't mean to be dark, but do you think he was trying to find the meaning of life so much against the real meaning of life that he took his life because it ate him alive? Mm. Just a pondering thought. Mm -hmm. Maybe. That was dark, man. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, bro. That was dark. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah, real dark. Let's, uh, let's segue somewhere else, man. <laughs> Where's the ball, man? Come on, get it. No, got... You heard the man. Test it out. Okay, well, that's okay, a great okay. quote, though. Uh, um, let's do one more question, and then we can just wrap, because I don't want to take too much more of your time. But, guys, it was such a pleasure. Man, pleasure was ours. so good. <laughs> one more. Fire one off. Okay. Um, what is the limit for God's forgiveness? Great question. Stuart? Well, you know, when Peter talks about 70 times 7, Jesus says that to, P to Peter. Obviously, it's an endless number. But if this person's talking about emotional or physical abuse, maybe it's something deeper than just, you know, a friend offended you and you guys are trying to reconcile, then I would use forgiveness first, then justice. Because you have to forgive 
and then seek justice. Otherwise, it's just going to be rage and resentment fueling your seeking justice. Mm. So it won't be real justice that you get, and it definitely won't be real forgiveness. So that's why I like him saying that, because whenever I talk to an atheist, they're like, Stuart, yeah, we just forgive for our own emotional well-being and our own personal freedom. I don't need to forgive people to reconcile or to better society. And I'm like, whoa, you're, you're missing the boat here, I think. So I would take that culturally and say, you look at BLM, you look at so many of these social justice movements, and they're fueled now as forgiveness in our country starts to wane because Christianity wanes some. You'll see that they're fueled by zero forgiveness. It's just justice, but the justice is centered on rage and resentment. So are they really getting justice? Mm. Or is it really just this type of insidious revenge that ends up occurring? So I think it's a great a, a defense of the faith to talk about forgiveness for the Christian but because what, it's lost. What would be the limit, though? Mm -hmm. When does God say, right. no more, I can't forgive you for this? Oh, so like Old Testament kind of stuff? The limit to where I think God's forgiveness runs out, I think, and I could be wrong, I would say it's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I feel like if you are... Uh, if you're not welcoming the Lord into your life, you can't blame him for the chaos that causes in your life. For example, I can't go to a doctor and get mad at him for not healing me when I didn't go to the doctor to get healed. Um, so I think his limit is technically your limit. How far are you willing to really seek out forgiveness and, and have faith? Am I wrong? No, that's exactly right. And, and I, I think that verse in terms of grieving the Holy Spirit and which one did you quote? I don't even know if I well, quote oh, blas it. Blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy of the Holy exactly. Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I love deconstructing that because it, it means you're just consistently turning away. And yeah. so finally God, lets, it goes back to like Romans 1, God finally gives you up to your own desires. And so he just, you're, you know, you decided to do this. So I don't know if God ever decides in his heart, I'm not going to forgive this person. Perhaps he does in the, in the judgment of certain people, people groups, especially in the Old Testament. But the forgiveness one is an interesting one because mm. I think he, again, I think he lets them, them over to their own desires when they really want to go because he, he respects their free will and that shows a loving God. If he didn't respect their free will and just created puppets and said, no, you're going to follow me no matter what, yeah. <laughs> then obviously that's not loving them. You know? Which is crazy that people don't understand how much love that is. Yeah. A God that could create you out of dust also is like, you could choose. Right. That's crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. There was a question that I'll, I remember screenshotting and they said, if God exists, why would he let the devil own this earth and run it? Um, and I think it's to see who's really choosing him or not. Right. I mean, if you created if a doctor, there's always a saying that if a doctor comes in, he's like, yo, we can give this pill to your baby right now. And anything he says or does, he's going to love you. So if you said red is red, red is red. Like he's just going to obey to every command that you say. That's not love. It's brainwashing. That's mm -hmm. making that person follow you. But I don't know if you've ever been in a relationship where you're like, I feel like this person's not even really wanting to be here. That's a, that's a burden on the heart. I would rather want to know if that person's there. And if there's nothing on the opposite end of it for them to choose between me or Satan, then you're never going to know if that love is real. Mm -hmm. Is that, mm -hmm. am I on the right path? Mm -hmm. Okay. I love how, like, I say it confidently. <laughs> I'm like, like, <laughs> so to forgive means to cancel a debt. If I rip a f pound of flesh out of you and you forgive me, what you're saying is, Cliff, I give up my right to rip a pound of flesh out of you the way you ripped a pound of flesh out of me. So it's to give up my right to get that pound of flesh back. In other words, it's paying a debt. It's absorbing the pain, absorbing the debt, and releasing the person from that debt. Second point. It does not mean that you're going to trust me the same way you did. If I steal your money, you forgive me and say, Cliff, I forgive you. But it does not mean you're going to trust me with your bank account, mm -hmm. with your stocks, with your finances. So to forgive does not mean I trust you the same way I once did. We're going to have to rebuild the trust over a period of time. How long that takes is pretty personal. Mm. And when you look at people in the way it takes them longer to build that trust back, you understand, okay, we can't force it. It's got to be something that's going to grow. Third point. One of the motives for followers of Christ to forgive is 
Forgiveness means something wrong was done, which means morality is not relative. Something wrong was done. I don't forgive you for giving me a million dollars. I forgive you for stealing a million dollars from me, mm -hmm. right? So forgiveness means something wrong was done, and I'm going to forgive you. Why? Because you are more important than the dastardly thing you did to me. And that's what forgiveness is. It's a choice. I am choosing to understand that you are more valuable than the dirty thing you did to me, and I will forgive you. But remember, for a fall of Christ, forgiveness means, although I will not judge you, I'm choosing to forgive you. There is a God who will judge you. And I can promise you, when you look at some of the things that have been occurring in the former Yugoslavia, Serbs, Croatians, in Rwanda, in Ukraine, it is an understanding that God is a judge, and there's going to be a day of judgment, and God is going to punish and destroy evil. That enables me, that helps me tremendously to forgive people who've done some horrible things to me. You take Jesus Christ out of the picture, you take God out of the picture, and there is no day of judgment. What, basically what happens is the trap door opens, we all fall through it, called death, and we just float for eternity. It's gone, finished, extinct. So justice never triumphs. No, no, no. Jesus taught that justice does triumph because God is just, God is good, but he's also merciful, forgiving, and he delights in forgiving us. So the only reason people don't get forgiven is because they don't ask for forgiveness. They don't humble themselves and say, Lord, I did wrong, please forgive me. That's the only reason they don't get forgiven. So the, in other words, there is nothing so bad that you can do that God can't forgive you. His love is bigger than my wrongdoing. But I... He's not going to force his forgiveness on me. I have to repent. I have to ask him for forgiveness. I used to work in a prison in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Every Monday night would go there. And I first would go into the cell of a man in protective custody who kidnapped little boys, sexually abused them, and murdered them. And after being with him, I would go into the basketball gym to play basketball with the other inmates. And they would come up to me and say, hey, Cliff, how can you even talk to such a piece of dirt? Don't you know what he did? And I say, yes, I do know what he did. Pretty horrendous, pretty grotesque, pretty evil. But he still is a human being, created in the image of God, and God offers him forgiveness, as horrible as that is. Now, there's a part of me that doesn't like that, because I've never kidnapped little boys, sexually molested them, and murdered them. So I think I'm better. No, unfortunately, I'm not better. Because in my own sophisticated, erudite way, I have rebelled against God. I am in desperate need of God's grace his forgiveness. And for me to look down on a guy like that and say, oh, you're just so inferior, you're just a piece of dirt. No. He's a human being created in the image of God. That image has been horribly defaced. Horribly. But he still is a human being created in the image of God, and God offers him forgiveness. Oh, that's cheap, Cliff. No, when you look at the cross of Christ, you understand that's God become a human being who sacrifices his life on a cross. He's the eternal God, as you were pointing out so accurately, George. He is all-powerful. He is eternal. And that he would become a human being and then go through the hell of the cross so that I wouldn't have to go to hell. Wow. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen. May I challenge that thought? Yes. I agree. I believe there's no wrong you could commit. That's why I got, I, I actually, well, I said something that it, it kind of went viral. I said I wouldn't kill Hitler. And people were like astounded by that. And my, and my theory behind it was, look how good of a speaker he was. The devil got to him because he mm -hmm. knew how powerful he could become. Mm -hmm. Now, what, if I could go back in time as a baby, I wouldn't kill him. I would teach him the right way. That is what I think I should do. Now, now that we understand God's mercy and we see that no man could go too far without him. I mean, there's so many Bible verses, right? There's the two brothers. Mm -hmm. One of them stays and feels yep. at the crowd and he goes, why are we throwing a celebration for the son that abandoned you yep. and now he's returned? Yep. And his quote was, don't even be worried about that. You should celebrate that he's here now. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yep. But my problem that I have that hurts my heart and it's hard for me to defend God because I don't. I don't have the wisdom to, to back this part up. Mm -hmm. How is it okay mm -hmm. that a man that just doesn't know who Jesus is and doesn't recognize him, but goes on and does good deeds, helps the orphans, helps uh, churches, uh, does whatever he wants, but he doesn't, he doesn't acknowledge that Christ is our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. He's sent to the same place that Hitler's going, that a rapist is going, that all these other mm -hmm. terrible humans... Right. But, and it's, and hell is endless, right? It's 
gnashing of the teeth forever. Is that right? Is hell forever? I don't know. Okay, well... Yes, it's forever. But the question is, is it gnashing of teeth forever? Yeah. In my mind, my and this is me just being... I, I pray that... I, I pray that whoever goes to hell gets burnt up and then no longer exists. Annihilation. But yes. my brain is, how could you eliminate something that's permanent, right? God is permanent. So you can't eliminate permanent stuff. So if we're made in his image, maybe we are suffering forever and always maybe. after. This is the most terrifying thing in the world to think about. Yep. But how could a man that just, all he did was not glorify Christ, but he gets put in the same oven, that a man who molested children, that kidnapped people. Right. How is that, how is that merciful? You bet. All right, first point is be very careful about people who give you a photograph of hell. The Bible does not give us a photograph of hell. It's not a burning place? Well, Jesus talks about it as fire. Yeah. But it know. also talks about outer darkness. So how do you have fire and outer darkness at the same time? I think he's speaking metaphorically. Oh, Cliff, that's, you're just quibbling. Oh, you're just, you're just getting out of a difficult place. Wait a second. Jesus uses metaphor all the time. It's symbolic language to make a point, to speak truth. I am the light of the world. No, Jesus is not claiming to be a hundred watt light bulb. I am the door. No, he's not claiming to be two pieces of plywood slapped together. He continuously uses metaphor to point to truth, but it's truth that is not quite as physical as I would like it to be. And I think that's part of what hell will be. Hell is separation from God. I've chose to live my life separate from him. And he says, fine, Cliff, you chose to live your life separate from me. You'll spend eternity separate from me. So just floating out in the universe, how they always say the universe is really big. Are they just floating in darkness? Or, or as you pointed out, they might be annihilated. Al you, is uh, annihilated mean gone? Gone. That's, destroyed. That's merciful, though. Destroyed. That, that, like, even though, okay, for example, I'd never want to raise my hand and, and be, hey, man, that guy molested some kids. Yep. He needs to burn in hell for the rest of his life. Right. A lot of people are not wise enough to understand that he probably molested somebody because he was molested. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of demons on him. Yep. And I'm not trying to uh, uh, judge him. Right. But I know that if I was God, blasphemy of his sounds, I, I, you could point out any evil man in the world. I don't know if I could torture him endlessly right. forever right. and ever right. and ever. I, if I know my God's more merciful than me, that's a hard pill to swallow. Correct. Um, but... My question is, how is it, regardless if it's t endless time away from him or gnashing of the teeth in a fire forever and always, mm -hmm. how is a man uh, first submit to a God that knows that Sarah, who's ho helping homeless people right now, dedicating her life, giving half of her money away, is in the same spot that Hitler and Genghis Khan is going? To me, it's hard for me to explain that to somebody. Right. And that's why I would not say same spot. Because I don't think hell is a spot. It's separation from God, but it's not a physical location necessarily. See, the, the Bible's sufficiently vague about it that I really don't know. And that's, you know, we got to be honest. Mm. It, it doesn't specifically picture it graphically. And I think that guys like Dante have at times done a disservice in adding to the Bible. I take the Bible very seriously, so seriously that I don't want to add to it. You shouldn't. Exactly. Because your word is human. Correct. So don't trust me. Trust Christ and read the Bible fairly. And I think if you read the Bible fairly, you'll realize it does not give us a physical description of hell. Oh, come on. It talks about what, fire. But what, it also what is talks the, about what, the fire part? What is, what are right. they, how, could you elaborate what it means? You bet. Thank you. Well, when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. When Jesus says to the woman um, in John chapter 4, I offer you living water. She misunderstands him. She thinks, oh, wow, give me this water. I'm not going to have to go back to the well again. No, no, he's not talking about physical water, man. He's talking about a relationship with himself. So he's using metaphor, symbolism, to communicate spiritual reality. Yes. When he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Could you use the mic? When he says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Yeah. Nicodemus misunderstands him and says, oh, right, I'm supposed to climb back into my mother's womb and come down the birth canal again? And she says, no, 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 Nicodemus. I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth, yeah. not a physical rebirth. All right, so when Jesus talks about hell and uses different images that seem to contradict each other, like fire and outer darkness, we've got to be real careful the way we interpret that because it's not as clear as some people think it is. What is it actually stated as? 
What is it like in the scripture? Well, how do they how do they describe it? Because you well, said d- yeah. outer darkness and hell and, and the fire, fire. Right. So is the fire described as internal fire, or what? What is the fire? It, like? it, it's not specifically defined. But you start us off in this session with Ma- uh, Matthew seven twenty one to twenty three. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I will tell some of these people, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Depart from me. So there's the idea of hell is departure from God, total departure. But that is totally hell. Separate. Oh yeah, there's hell. That's, that's hell. That's hell. To be correct. To be away from life. Exactly. Is hell correct? What's Gehenna, where the worm does not die? So that that's, just shows the eternal nature of it. Very good. So Gehenna was the garbage dump, right, outside Jerusalem, and so the New Testament takes this picture of the garbage dump outside of the city of Jerusalem and says, this is hell, the garbage dump. Garbage dump, it's garbage, it's refuge. It ain't coming back, it's gone. Separation from God, you're not coming back into God's presence, you're not coming back to life. You're in hell, you're separated from God, and if you think you're gonna have a party in hell, you're sadly mistaken because all the good gifts that we have to enjoy a party are from God. So if I'm separated from God, I'm separated from all those good things that allow me to enjoy a party. So heaven will be an eternal party, and hell will be eternal separation from God, which means there ain't no party. This is the pits. This is horrible. This stinks. What George is saying, though, too, we talked about how there's probably levels in heaven because of what Paul talks about in striving. Yeah, isn't it there's a heaven and then there's the kingdom of God, correct? Yeah, well, and just what is it going to look like in terms of who strove for what prize to, to win the crown when we were talking about levels of heaven? Because yes. if there are levels of heaven, yeah. there's probably levels of hell. And I'm not saying purgatory. Right. A lot of my Catholic friends believe in purgatory, and that, that right. softens it a lot. Yeah. What is purgatory? Is that like when people believe in ghosts, where they're like just no, wandering? Purgatory is um, a church tradition. It's not in the Bible. It's a church tradition that says, okay, you believe in Jesus, Cliff, but you've done some really horrible things. And so therefore, because you've done some really horrible things, you've got to pay for it. That counteracts the Bible. Bingo. Very yeah, good, yeah. George. Because then there's nothing that... That's like saying the bill came and God goes, ah, I can't afford this. Very good. There's right. no sin right. that he can't... If you truly believe he died for you on the cross and that he... And by the way, it's not like, I'm going to sin because he died for me on the cross. God's judging your heart. Yep. If you truly, with yep. all your heart, tried your best right. and you pointed to the cross every time that somebody was like, hey, what's going on? No, cross. Hey, no, th- no, cross. And you truly believe that. I don't believe that God's like, ah, hey, man, you did a lot of bad. I can't really get this bill. Right. That's, that's, and that breaks my heart that a church made that up. Was, why are you smiling at me? <laughs> well, you've got some precious family members who might be disagreeing with you right now, right? Oh, I don't care what they think. No, I know you don't. But, <laughs> but, but as you pointed out earlier, I don't want to, you know, let's not make it, turn it into a major. It's a minor. Mm. The major is the grace of God. The major is you put your faith in Christ and you're going to be in heaven. Yeah. And if you happen to be out of a, a background where you're taught about purgatory and some of the other things you're taught in that church tradition, I don't want to... No, challenge them. We can challenge them, yes. Pardon? No, but you, yeah. you, you alluded to possibly... A Offend Catholic, other people? A Catholic member of your family. And Listen, I did, I'm open up for the conversation. If you could show me that purgatory exists and then there's a reason in the Bible, I'm totally fine. Let's have a conversation. His fam is good like that, though. I, I don't think that all of a sudden they're going to start not talking well, to each if other. Your mom, if your mom is out of a Catholic background, she would believe in purgatory, wouldn't uh, No, our church doesn't. They're, oh, they're no? like Orthodox... We're apostolic Catholic. Pardon? So we're apostolic Catholic. Apostolic Catholic. We're not Roman. Oh, oh it's, okay. It's good. Look how complicated it gets. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, I feel so bad because people are like, yo, I want to believe in Jesus, but what team? And it's yeah. like, bro, I don't even know. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, dude, don't that's, trust me. Don't trust Cliff. This guy right. drinks. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't trust any of us. Sure. We're here. We're just being vulnerable and showing you our love of God. That's but we're right. disgusting, vile, vile, vile human beings. And because of the mercy of God, we could, you know, have these conversations right. and one day be in the presence of God. Not because of us or our knowledge or our good deeds. It's yeah. just because we're we are truly following the scripture and we're reading and we're trying to be better. Yes. Um, now, if I challenge you, if I offend you, get over it. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, get over it. You get over yourself. If you say something about my God, you'll never see me being like, "I'll oh, dare you." Like, nah, right, bro. Right. I feel bad for you. Okay. Like, let's talk about it. Right. But if you're offended by something I think or I see or I do, do one of those things that he was talking about and grow up. 
<laughs> Grow up. <laughs> Grow up. If you truly believe that your point of view is correct, pray for me. I know a lot of people that are Muslims that are really good friends of mine. Good. They go, buddy, you need to read the Quran. And I tell them, like, pray for me. If your God and my God are in a disagreement, let's pray. I pray that you, my friend, are coming with me into heaven. And I pray that if you believe in your God and I am wrong and I'm going to be abandoned from the kingdom of heaven, pray for me. I'm wrong. But let's see. But I know my God's merciful and he'll show me the way. Um, but I have to do my work, man. It's a, you, you draw near to him and then he draw near to you. It's kind of like royalty, right? I'm not going to expect the king to come to my village and talk to me about what's going on in my house. I'm going to present myself to the king. And by the way, I'm going to be on my knees. A lot of people nowadays talk as God is their homie, like their friend. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hey, oh, yeah. man, that's, he <laughs> is the busy. king of kings and the yeah, Lord of lords. Right. Come yeah. with some respect. I remember one time I came to a church. And when I go to my church, the Syrian church, we button up. There's a prayer that they sing where my mom just like grabs my head and puts it down. She goes, you understand, we are asking God to come into our presence. So I'm like, she goes, if angels are shaking in this moment, who are you not to put your head down? So this is the background. This is the, this is the, 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 the feeling that I have with God's in my presence. I came to one church where people are chewing gum, swearing. I swear. Not at God's house. You know what I mean? They're sitting there chewing gum. They're putting their legs up. They're texting. And I go, yo, yo, Wearing you guys tops. would act like this? You guys would act like this if God was around? I had a conversation with my family members, and they were talking. And I just said one thing. I go, would you be talking like this about the Bible if God was around? And she just got quiet. I go, no, you wouldn't. So why don't you bite down your tongue? Because, like, dude, he's here. And he's listening to the way that you're talking with such, with such emphasis that's not okay when you talk about the Bible. Don't do that. Mm. Like, for example, it's, it's all about respect, too. For example, I don't believe the Quran and the way Muslim people, their life. I don't believe that. I believe in Christianity. But do you think my Jesus would want me to condemn, mock, or dismiss, Good. or disrespect them? Good for you. Never. Mm -hmm. Those are my brothers and my sisters. We just have a different point of view, and I'd rather sit down and have a conversation out of love than to ever be like, no, nah, dog, meet me outside, bro. And by the way, not for nothing, I, and I told this to my mom, out of all religions, I really respect the way that Muslims are so guttural about their religion. Yeah. Bro, you talk about Dude. Jesus and we're like, okay. Uh, you talk right. about their God, they're like, okay, let's meet outside. And I, lo <laughs> I love that more than anything, bro. I love that. It's because they respect their God and they'll be damned if you're going to disrespect their God. Mm -hmm. And we Christians don't respect the gods that we should be respecting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yes. If that makes any sense. Totally. Total I sense. take pieces of everybody's religion and I like to practice it. And when Dang. it comes to Muslims, I love the way they, they honor their God. Yeah. Prayer. They they honor. I went into their, uh, I went into, um, what uh, 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 country was I in? Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. To be honest, as an American, I was nervous going because I'm an outspoken Christian. I, uh, I, I've read these stories about these type of countries. Never in my life have I had such a great time. The amount of respect, mm -hmm. the amount of, like, dude, I would go into a, please, my friend, let me get this. We'd sit down. They would give me a meal. They would invite me to their house. The most honorable people I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And I sat back and I go, my God, was I a little racist for thinking that I was in trouble by being here? Mm -hmm. Have I been fed these type of uh, uh, thoughts in my own mind? And it's like, dude, don't take other people's point of views and run mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I had to rudely be awakened when I sat here and I'd be like, look how, they, look how respectful they are. I could be like them when it comes to respect. Mm. I'm not going to talk about your God, but buddy, you better not talk about my God in my presence like that. <laughs> I respect that. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take away from it. I just think that we could get to a place where we could have different points of views and, and respect each other. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, it was such a pleasure having I've you guys. I've done Blast. It pleasure. was a pleasure. Thank you guys, thank you so, thank much. You guys so, so much. much. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, good to talk. Oh, so I'm attached to corn. <laughs> <laughs>